Yes. It's finally happened. Your eyes do not deceive. I cleaned my bookshelf. Howdy. My name is Nonat. And welcome to the long-awaited, much-anticipated, incredibly commentated... <laughs> kineticist Deep Dive. I hope you can look at the length of this video. Look at the scroll bar. Because we're gonna be here for a while. Thank you all so much for your patience on waiting for this video to come out. I'm not gonna bore you by giving a big intro. We're gonna jump right into this because this video is monumental. Though I am gonna bore you with one quick explanation and that's that this video is divided into nine different chapters just in case you come to this video looking for a specific chapter or just want to re-watch a specific chapter. They're gonna be divided by the basics and then all of the different chapter feats because there's so freaking many earth, fire, wind, water, do you remember? They're all there and if you wanna skip ahead or back, they are clickable. And there is no sponsor for this video. Once again, I want the only sponsorship to be your watch time. So if you enjoy this video, please do watch the whole thing through. It doesn't have to be in one sitting. This is a monster. If all things go as I assume they will, this will be over two hours long. That is a feature length film, and I do not expect you to sit there for two hours straight, except for you. I do see you. You're playing World of Warcraft on your other monitor. I'm up. Let's do this. So without further ado, Chapter 1, The Basics! Before I even read you what's on the page, I do want to give a brief explanation of what a kineticist even is, because if you're coming in blind or you've never even played Pathfinder, you might not know at first glance. A kineticist, the best and easiest way to explain it, is a bender from Avatar. You are a manipulator of an element, specifically not a spellcaster. When it comes to things that affect spellcasters, they don't affect kineticists, kind of, I'll get to that later. But overall, you are neither a martial class nor a spellcaster. You are just a kineticist, which makes some things a little more complicated, but lets you do some really cool stuff. And that's also the reason this video is two hours long. Some kineticists manipulate one element expertly, other kineticists manipulate multiple elements with less expertise. They're very, very complicated and customizable, but that means you could be someone who just bends the earth element and makes armor and rocks fall and all these cool effects, or maybe you manipulate earth, water, and air to be able to use all three of them at different times. That's completely up to you. So let's get started and talk about the basic, basic, basics, which is that the kineticist is a constitution-based character, which I love. A lot of their abilities, in fact, most of their abilities, even their attack roles, use their constitution modifier. And I think that is amazing. It is the only example in the official rules that use constitution for any kind of aggressive ability. They also get eight plus constitution modifier hit points per level. So while they're not the tankiest tankiest every level, they do have con as a primary uh, modifier. So they're going to be getting probably plus four from constitution per level. So you're looking at 12 hit points a level, just a little bit less than a barbarian. They begin the game trained in perception, expert in fortitude saves, expert in reflex saves, and trained in will saves, a decent enough array. They are trained in nature, obviously, as well as three plus intelligence in additional skills. They are only trained in simple weapons, which most of the time you're probably not going to be using a weapon anyway, and they are only trained in light armor. There are a few ways to get around this depending on your element of choice, but for the most part, your kineticist is limited to light armor. So a little bit of dexterity might go a long way for keeping you safe, especially if you are a ranged or not heavily armored kineticist. Once again, I'll get to that later. You're going to hear that a lot throughout this video of, I'll get to that later, or some kineticist, because the kineticist is probably the single most customizable class in the game. And of course, they are trained in their kineticist class DC, which will be used a lot. So right at level one, you start with your kinetic gate. This is your element of choice, or elements, because there are two different types of kineticists right out the gate. Thank you, thank you. When you make a level one kineticist, you can choose to either be a single gate or dual gate kineticist. And there are some differences here. At face value, they're what they sound like. Are you going to specialize in one element or be good at two elements? 
The elements you can choose from are air, earth, fire, metal, water, and wood. Yes, metal and wood are considered their own elements here, which is what leads to so much damn customization. Six different things to pick from, and you can mix and match them. But keep in mind, a kineticist, once again, is different from a spellcaster. You only have access to the elements you choose. If you choose water, you can only use features that involve the water element. So why would you ever pick a single gate over a dual gate? Well, like I said, a single gate is much more expert at their element of choice. A dual gate kineticist gets to pick two elements and then any two first level impulse feats. These can be from either of the lists of the elements you chose. If you chose earth and water, you can choose from the earth list and water list of impulse feats. If you choose to be a single gate kineticist, you do still get two first level impulse feats, but they can only be from the one element you chose. If you chose air, you can only pick your feats from the air impulse feat lists. However, you do also get a unique starting elemental junction. A junction is a simple passive effect that automatically happens when you use an impulse feat of two actions or more. Stay with me, this gets complicated. So if you choose air as a single gate kineticist, then you get to activate the air junction if you ever use an air impulse of two actions or more. And what this means is before or after the other effects of the impulse, you can either stride up to half your speed or step. If you have a fly speed, you can fly up to half your fly speed instead. So it gives you a free movement along with your impulse. So now, before I go any further, what is an impulse feed? An impulse is basically the kineticist's version of spells. They are not a spell caster, but their abilities are vaguely spell-like. The most important one that all of them start with is their elemental blast. Every single kineticist, whether they're single gate or dual gate, can all make the elemental blast action right at level one. And this can be done for one or two actions. The damage die, damage type, and range increment of your elemental blast are all based on your chosen element or the element you are currently using for your blast. If you are air, it deals 1d6 electricity or slashing damage with a range of 60 feet. What's really useful about these or damage types, how air says electricity or slashing, is you get to choose every time you use this blast. If you zap someone with electricity and they take reduced damage, maybe they have a resistance, then next time you blast, you can choose to do slashing instead. Earth has a range of 30 feet, deals 1d8 bludgeoning or piercing damage. Fire deals 1d6 fire damage with a range increment of 60 feet. Metal deals 1d8 piercing or slashing damage with a range increment of 30 feet. Water deals 1d8 bludgeoning or cold damage with a range increment of 30 feet. And wood deals 1d8 bludgeoning or vitality damage with a range increment of 30 feet. That vitality is really unique to wood. So remember, that is the new positive damage. And these function just like a normal attack roll. On a success, they deal their damage. On a critical success, you double all of your damage. However, you do see that they can be done with one or two actions. If you use one action to make an elemental blast, you simply deal the listed damage. If you're air, you are dealing 1d6 damage. However, if you use two actions, you get to add your constitution modifier to the damage roll. So one action is only 1d6, but two uh, actions is suddenly 1d6 plus four. On top of that, you can also choose to make your elemental blast as a melee strike. If you are in melee when using your elemental blast and choose to make it a melee strike, you get to add your strength modifier to the damage. So for example, I'm currently playing a strength-based earth kineticist, so when I'm in melee for two actions, I get to make my attack roll, and if I hit, I'm dealing 1d8 bludgeoning plus three from strength plus four from constitution, which is awesome. So let's take a step backwards, back at these junctions. If you were to use a two action elemental blast, your junction does activate because that was a two action impulse. However, if you take the one action elemental blast, your junction does not activate because it is only on two action or more impulses. 
The other impulses for the other single gate element kinetisis for Earth gives you a plus one bonus to armor class until the start of your next turn. Fire increases the damage die size of fire damage dealt by that impulse. So if your two action elemental blast deals, I believe, base 1d6, then if you are a single gate fire kinetisis, that deals 1d8 instead. And that applies to all of your impulses. If you have a giant AoE firestorm that deals 1d4 to all targets, then if you have the junction, it becomes 1d6 to all targets. The metal junction allows you to deal half your level in damage back to creatures that hit you with an unarmed strike or non-reach melee weapon, and when you use your impulse, you get to choose if this damage is acid, electricity, or piercing. The acid is fascinating there, that metal gets access to that. The water junction allows you to move any creature five feet in any direction except vertical. However, it must be a willing creature or a creature that failed its saving throw against your impulse. Or a creature you hit with an impulse attack roll. For example, a water elemental blast can hit a target and then shove them five feet in any direction for free. And finally, the wood junction grants you temporary hit points equal to your level until the start of your next turn, which means if you're using an impulse every single turn as a wood kineticist, you're just getting free shielding in the form of temp hit points every single turn. And impulse attack rolls and DCs are calculated almost the exact same way as spell attack rolls and spell DCs, they just use your constitution modifier. So it's going to be proficiency plus attribute modifier. If you've got an 18 constitution at level one, you're gonna have a plus seven to your attack rolls and a DC 17 impulse DC. Keep in mind that because you are constitution based, the drained condition is especially lethal against kineticists because it does lower your attack rolls and save DCs. Also, you can get an item as you level up called a gate attenuator. Because kineticists don't use weapons, they do get this item, which can give you plus one, plus two, plus three to your impulse attack rolls, but not to your impulse save DCs. Keep that in mind. Now, unlike a spellcaster, the kineticist can't just use their impulses at the drop of a hat like a spellcaster. They actually have a one-action setup called channel elements. For one action, you, you channel your elements. If you're a single-gate kineticist, you just call your single element. But if you're a dual-gate kineticist, you actually channel both at the same time. You always have access to both. If you're earth and water, you might have little chunks of muddy, drippy gravel mud just swirling around you at all times while you're channeling it. This actually creates a kinetic aura around you, which extends in a 10-foot emanation. At base level, this does not do anything, but there are a lot of abilities the kineticists have that interact with this 10-foot emanation aura, so keep that in mind. Also, as part of channeling your element, you can use a one-action impulse or one-action elemental blast. So that is a nice little way that even while you're getting set up for combat, you can still shoot out a weaker elemental blast for one action that just doesn't add your con modifier to damage. So even though you are setting up, you still get an action out of it, and this is a great way to lead into maybe a two-action impulse that requires a saving throw. So even if you're not currently set up for combat, you can channel element, make your attack roll, and then two action impulse for a saving throw. The reason you'd want to do a saving throw over an attack roll is impulse attack rolls still follow multiple attack penalty. So if you attacked once, then if you tried to elemental blast a second time, it would be at minus five. This aura does last until you're knocked out or manually dismiss it. However, an interesting fact is that any impulse you've activated with a duration stays in effect even if your aura goes away. For example, there's an earth impulse that gives you heavy armor for 10 minutes, and even if your aura deactivates, you get to keep your armor on until that duration expires. The only exception to this are impulses with the stance trait, which do end the second your aura goes away. I've already mostly explained impulses, but there is a very minor thing that will come up occasionally that is important to know. Impulses, even though they are not spells, can still be affected by abilities that cancel and counteract spells. Impulses are inherently magical. So if a creature has an inherent saving throw against all spells, that does work against your impulses. As well as if you've been polymorphed into a form that would prevent spell casting, that also prevents impulses. It's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but the general idea for you GMs out there is yes, impulses are magic. They can be detected by detect magic. They can't be used in an anti-magic field, provided the level is high enough. Also worth explaining is the way that 
impulses work by level. They're not spells, so they don't have spell ranks. An impulse is always the same level as the person casting it, which means impulses go all the way up to level 20. So a lot of impulses we may read here today might say heightened plus two. Now for a spell, that would mean every two spell ranks, but for an impulse, that actually just means every two character levels, which is the same as heightened plus one on a spell. I know that gets very confusing. This class is very confusing. It is the most advanced class in Pathfinder 2e to date. So just keep that in mind when reading an impulse's heightened effect. That is based on character level, while a spell's heightened effect is based on spell rank. Follow me? No? Cool, let's move on. What are we at? 25 minutes recording? We're still in chapter one? Let's go. All kineticists also start with the base kinesis feature. You can sort of think of this as the kineticist prestidigitation. Very, very minor effects that all kineticists can do regarding their chosen element. For two actions, you can interact with a negligible or light bulk amount of your element within 30 feet. This cannot interact with anything that is magically secured or if it is currently possessed by a creature. You know, just because you are a metal kineticist doesn't mean you can nudge that person's dagger out of their hand. If they have a firm grip on it, you cannot use base kinesis on it. There are three general effects that base kinesis can do. Generate, move, and suppress. Generate and suppress are the opposite. You either create a negligible or light bulk, which light bulk I think is about a pound or less if I had to guess. So you can think of generate as being able to create roughly one pound or less of your chosen element, a block of dirt, a cup of water, etc. What's very cool about generate though is it says it can be used for any of its normal uses. Water can be consumed, air can be breathed, earth can be molded, you know, very very neat. Suppress is the opposite. You can destroy up to one light bulk worth of your element, completely eradicating it from existence and returning it to its elemental plane. The difference here is that this can only be done on natural forms. You can't destroy part of a sculpted statue. You can't destroy part of a forged weapon. But it can put out a candle. It can remove the water from a cup. It can make it hard to breathe for like a tenth of a second, I guess. And finally, you can move up to a light bulk of your element 20 feet in any direction, and if you can reach yourself, you can actually catch and hold your element in your hand. If you're a fire kineticist and there's a candle 15 feet away, you can just suck the flame of the candle and hold it in your hand visibly to show to people. Kind of a cool party trick, like prestidigitation. Every four character levels, at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17, the range increases by 15 feet, and the amount of element you can manipulate increases by one bulk. It increases to one bulk at 5th level, and then two bulk at 9th level, three at 13th, and up to four bulk worth of element at level 17, which is a lot. Again, that is roughly 40 pounds of your element. God, let me know how that works with air, because air doesn't have a lot of mass. How much air is that? <laughs> and with that... We move on to the class features. We're not even at feats yet, ladies and gentlemen. We are at the level one to 20 class features. Everything we just talked about, that's level one. That was level one kineticist. Luckily, their class features overall are a little simple. I lied, they're not. Here we go. You get kineticist feats starting at level one. Normally, spellcasters get them at level two and martial classes get them at level one. Kineticists get a first level feat. Now, once again, keep in mind, this can be from the universal feat list or any of your elemental feat lists. So a level one kineticist gets three first level feats from multiple different lists. Second level, they get skill feats like any other character. Third level, they get extract element. Extract element at third level is really cool. You do still need to have already channeled your element to activate it, but for one action, you can extract a chunk of elemental matter from a creature who has a trait that matches one of your channelable elements. If you are an air kineticist, you can extract a chunk of elemental air out of an air elemental. That's a weird sentence. They need to be within 30 feet of you and make a fortitude save against your class DC or take 2d4 points of damage and, quote, become susceptible to your impulses. 
If they critically succeed their fortitude save, unfortunately nothing happens. But even if they normal succeed, they become way more approachable as a combat encounter. If they were immune to your elemental damage, they instead swap to having a resistance equal to that creature's level. If they only had a resistance to your element, it is ignored. So if you're fighting a fire elemental with fire resist 15 and you successfully extract element with your fire kineticist, suddenly all of your fire impulses are dealing full damage to this thing. It also takes a minus one circumstance penalty to saving throws and its AC against your impulses. Hilariously, one of the strongest ways to fight an elemental is to have a kineticist of that element in your party. I love that. It makes it so kineticists aren't useless if they're fighting something that is immune or resistant to their only element, especially if they're a single gate. And what's nice is even if you fail, you can try again and again and again until you succeed. Once you succeed, you can't do it again, and it lasts for five minutes. On a failure, they take the normal damage. On a critical failure, they take double damage. There's no other effects, and the damage increases by 1d4 every two character levels. General feats, skill feats, expert and will saves, ancestry feats. And at fifth level, we get to the gates threshold. Now, I'm going to explain how this works now, but then a lot of it's going to come later. So, let me explain how the gates threshold works. You have two choices at level 5 and then every four levels after. So, 5, 9, 13, and 17, you have to make a choice. You can either expand the portal or fork the path. Path forker. I'm going to start with fork the path because it's simpler. If you choose to fork the path, you get to add an element to your collection of channelable elements. Whether you were a single or dual gate, you get to increase your number of elements by one. If you were earth water, you can add fire in there. And now you can take feats from any of those elements and you get a free bonus feat for forking the path. It does have to be of that element though. So at level five, if you add fire to your repertoire, you have to take a fire feat of lower than level five. You also cannot select a composite feat when gaining this bonus. We'll go over composites way later. Now, if you choose to expand the portal, you do not add a new element to your repertoire. However, you do get to pick a new impulse feat of your level or lower of either your element, or if you already have multiple elements, you can pick a composite feat that you qualify for the prerequisites for, for level and stuff. So if you are an earth and water dual gate kineticist and reaching level five, you expand the portal, you could take a level four or lower earth and water composite impulse. That's chapter nine. Don't worry about that for another hour and a half. Now, you also gain a gate junction for one of your currently channeled elements. And I'm actually going to be going over the details of these later in each element's respected chapter. But there are five distinct types of junction, and every single element gets one of each type. And at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17, if you choose to expand the portal, you get to pick one for one of your channeled elements. The five different types of gate junctions, starting with the Critical Blast. This is sort of the Kineticist version of Critical Specialization. If you get a Critical Strike with an Attack Impulse, then you get to add the corresponding effect of that Elemental Critical Blast Junction. The Elemental Resistance Junction grants you resistance equal to your level to every damage type listed in that element's Elemental Resistance. Just as an example, Metal here gives you resistance equal to your level to electricity and metal traded damage forever as long as your Kinetic Aura is active. At level 17, you become immune to damage types with that trait. The Aura Junction adds a permanent effect that is always active within that 10-foot emanation I mentioned like half an hour ago. While your Kinetic Aura is active and you have channeled an element, if you take the Aura Junction, that effect is always active within that 10-foot emanation. The Skill Junction grants you trained proficiency in all of the listed skills of that element. If you were already trained in those skills, you can choose something else. And as long as your kinetic aura is active and you're channeling your element, you gain a plus one status bonus 
two checks with that skill. At level 10, this increases to plus two, and at level 17, this increases to plus three, meaning your kineticist can actually get insanely strong with specific skills. For example, a water gate with the athletics from their skill junction, if they bump that up to legendary with their skill bumps, have a high strength score, and have their skill junction at level 17, their bonus is gonna be through the roof. And finally, if none of those four options are interesting to you, you can go back and choose any of the junctions available to level one single gate kineticist, even if you didn't start as a single gate kineticist. If you were an earth water dual gate kineticist, you could choose to take the impulse junction, which, you know, the water one that lets you shove someone when they, when you hit them with a two action attack, you can choose that at this level. I'm going to go over each element's critical, aura, elemental, and skill junction in their respected chapter. Level 7, you get Master Proficiency in Fortitude and Auto Crit Succeed Normal Successes. You also get Expert Proficiency in your Kineticist Class DC. This is amazing for your save DCs. Level 9 is Expert in Perception. Level 11 is Master in Reflex Saves and Auto Crit Succeeding Normal Success. And at 11th level, you also get Reflow Elements. Reflow Elements allows you once per day during daily preparations to replace any impulse feat in your character with another feat of the same level or lower with the same elemental trait. So if you are our theoretical earth water kineticist, then you can replace your fourth level earth impulse with a second level earth impulse as instead if it would be more helpful that day. And this is a permanent change until you change it again. Just be sure if you do replace it with a lower level feat, maybe note somewhere that you replaced a fourth level feat with a second level because that way you could then still consider that second level class feat a quote unquote fourth level feat so you could trade it back up. I hope that makes sense. Retraining is a little bit weird if you change the level of the feat you chose. You should just remember the level you originally got that feat. The only exception to all of this is that you cannot reflow any compound impulses. Once you choose those, those are stuck. Weapon expertise. You get expert proficiency in weapons at level 11 you know, for all those weapons you're using. Level 13, they finally get expert proficiency in light armor. Kineticists are glass cannons, keep that in mind. It, usually. Weapon specialization at level 13, greater kinetic durability at level 15. This increases your fortitude saves to legendary. If you critically fail against an effect, you only normal fail, and normal fails against damaging effects still take half damage. Level 15 increases your class DC to master. Level 17 gives you double reflow, meaning once per day, you can swap out two impulse feats instead of one. Level 19 gives you master proficiency in light armor, legendary proficiency in your class DC, and the final gate class feature. Final gate means on the first turn of any encounter, you get to automatically, as a free action, channel elements. And this does come with the free one action impulse or elemental blast. The only exception to this is if you could not act in the first place, if you were restrained or unconscious or whatever. But otherwise, as long as you are able to act on your first turn of combat, you get a free action to channel your element and one action impulse. So, there's the basics. That is the basics of the kineticist. So how about we get into chapter two, universal feats. Also known as kineticist class feats, I've just always called them universal feats because they can be taken by any and all kineticists so long as you meet the prerequisites. As it says here on the page, whenever you gain just a kineticist class feat at levels one, two, and every even level on, you can choose from either the universal kineticist class feats or any class feats that you meet the prerequisites for regarding your chosen element, elements, or a compound of multiple elements you have already selected. But in this chapter, we are going over just the basic universal class feats available to any kineticist of that level, starting with level one's Elemental Familiar. This is a typical spellcaster's familiar with some slight augmentations to make it more elemental. First off, it uses your constitution modifier for all of its different familiar abilities, and you can pick one of the elemental familiars on page 42, which we'll take a look at real quick. There's a few new familiar abilities like Elemental, Jet, and Levitator, as well as some really cute new familiars like the Mood Cloud. I'm not going to be going over them all here, but they are very cute. 
Additionally, every day during daily preparations, you can actually choose a different familiar as long as you can channel more than one element. So if you are air and earth and you started with the mood cloud, well, during your daily preparations, you can actually basically dismiss the mood cloud and take the earth element familiar instead. Extended Kinesis is an augmentation of your base Kinesis feature, basically taking the Kineticist's Prestidigitation and giving you even more options with it. It now gives you the additional options of Proliferate, Regulate, and Sculpt. Proliferate is a little bit stronger than Generate, as while Generate makes you just create a small substance of your element, Proliferate takes an existing amount of your element and expands it. You can either create the same amount of itself next to itself in the same square, you can expand it to fill its current square, or create the same amount of element in an adjacent square. For example, if there's a two-foot sand castle, you could expand it to just become a big slab of sand that fills a five-foot square. Keep in mind, this can once again only be done to existing matter, but if there's a pile of twigs on the ground, you could create an identical pile of twigs next to it, or expand it to have even more twigs to fill a five-foot square, which maybe your GM would allow as difficult terrain. Once again, similar to Prestidigitation, this effect is only going to be as good as your creativity to use it. Regulate can only be used with air, fire, metal, and water, and it changes the temperature, either cooling it or warming it. Interestingly, you can make it so hot or so cold that a fire goes out or water even evaporates. And apparently, so it says, is if you create a, an environment for an item that makes it like hot enough to be used as an improvised weapon, it deals one fire or even cold damage GM's discretion. It functions as an improvised weapon, but I guess if you make like a big icicle with this, then you could use it to bonk somebody for a cold damage. It's not that useful, but it is kind of funny. I can already see the pranks being played where a player gets up and leaves the table and the kineticist is like, hee hee hee, and freezes their beer in their mug and then just does, looks away. You know, everyone's going to know it was them, but the beer will be frozen and that's kind of funny. It's not that funny. It's kind of funny. And Sculpt, which can only be used with earth, metal, or wood, though I think there's a missed opportunity to be able to use with water for ice, uh, but you are able to sculpt a small, crude statuette, or even a small tool, like I assume a lockpick, or like a hammer, or once you're character level 5, you can make a long tool, like a pitchfork or a shovel. It functions, and it works. It just has no cell value, as it's too crude and put together. So, like, it's a lumpy, cruddy shovel. But if you need to dig a grave, a level 5 kineticist is there to help. Versatile Blasts adds another damage type to every single element's elemental blast. And this is, remember, you can choose every time you make a blast which kind of damage you want to deal. And this one adds cold damage to air, poison damage to earth, cold damage to fire, which is interesting. I guess you use your elemental blast to sort of suck the heat out of the target. Uh, electricity damage to metal, acid damage to water, and poison damage to wood. My only complaint with this feat is that it's, there's a lot of uh, re uh, rep repeating. You know, there's two colds, there's two poison, and then electric and acid. It's cool, it's nice to get that versatility on your kineticist. I just wish each element got something totally unique for a damage type. And the final level one feat is undoubtedly the single strongest level one feat by way too wide of a margin. Oh my god, how did this get past review? Weapon infusion. As a free action, if your next action is to make an elemental blast, choose a weapon shape for it to take. You can then change your elemental blast damage, whatever type it would normally be regardless of your element, to bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing every single time you use this free action and gain another bonus depending on if it's melee or ranged. If it's melee, you can give it Agile, Backswing, Forceful, Reach, or Sweep, and you get to choose one of these every time you make the attack. So you could do Reach for your first attack, step in, and then do Agile. Or, even more insane, the ranged option just gives it an insane ranged increment. It does not matter what the base range increment of your Elemental Blast is. If it's a 30-foot Earth Blast and you have Weapon Infusion, cool. For a free action, you can give your thing a 100-foot range. And yeah, it has the volley trait. Oh no. Then you just use it at close range as the 20 foot range with the throne trait. That means you get to add half your strength modifier to it. This is insane. 
This means you get to choose and customize your custom weapon every time you make an elemental blast. And it doesn't say you can only choose one for each. That's how we've homebrewed it at my table. This is so strong. I talked to the GM and said, hey, can we just homebrew it so I get one melee option and one ranged option? Because having access to all of that every time I make an attack roll, along with just being super powerful, is super annoying. Because, you know, you need to remember the exact details of all five of those traits, uh, seven of those traits, because you've also got propulsive and thrown in there as well. Like, this feat does way too much. Oh my god. At the very least, this should have cost an action. Being able to triple my range increment on my elemental blast, that's worth an action. But this is free. Level two, kinetic activation. You can cast spells out of scrolls like a spellcaster so long as the spell itself contains a trait of one of your channelable elements. I think that's super cool. If you are a fire kineticist, you can cast a scroll of fireball. Scrolls are not useless for the kineticist. And you even get to use your impulse attack roll in DC instead of any kind of spell DC. This also works for stabs. You get half your level rounded up to their charges. It's so cool. If you really want like a, a kineticist with a little bit of quote unquote spell casting, you can right at level two. Voice of elements, also really, really neat. You can speak any language associated with any of the elements you can channel, and you can communicate even with mindless elementals that share that trait. Not only, so you can actually roll diplomacy with them, and you get a plus two to any charisma-based check involving elementals, mindless or not. As long as they are one of your channeled elements, you are inherently better at talking to them, and that is such a flavorful feat if it comes up. Command Elemental is okay. For two actions, if you target an elemental who shares a trait with one of your elements, if they're three levels or lower than you, and they fail their saving throw, they are controlled by you, sustained up to a minute. If they are two levels lower than you, or higher, they're slowed one on a failed save. The nice thing about them failing is this does not allow any follow-up saves. So, it might take multiple tries. If they succeed twice, but then they finally fail, you can keep them slowed for one minute as long as you sustain it. The downside is if they critically succeed, they are immune for 24 hours. <laughs> if they crit fail, you can sustain it for up to an hour, which is nice. If you just like, if you're level 10 and you find like a little level three elemental walking around, you can just be like, hey buddy, critical failure save because this is Pathfinder and you have no chance of succeeding. And now you have a little buddy for an hour. It's great. Uh, the only way the control doesn't work is if somebody else is already controlling the target, in which case uh, the controlling creature can actually roll their save if it's stronger. Oh, actually the controlling creature also rolls a save, not instead, they both roll and use the highest result. Safe elements, a really, really cooperative feat. Uh, whenever you activate your kinetic aura, you can designate a number of creatures up to your constitution modifier who are either completely unaffected by the aura or just immune to the negative effects. So if you have an aura that deals constant damage around you but also increases the armor class of your allies, you can say, hey, my four allies are immune to just the damage and negative effects so they still get the bonus to armor class when they're near me. Super, super cool feat, which even comes with an extra extra action, pacifying infusion. If your next action is an impulse, not only does it gain non-lethal, but you can exclude allies from its effects that you designated with safe elements. So you channel your elements, you get your fighter and your barbarian designated as safe. You could throw a, an impulse, you know, there, there's, there's an earth impulse that just drops rocks in a 30 foot area. Your barbarian and fighter, completely safe, no saving throw. Love this feat. I probably should have taken it on my Earth Kineticist. I almost killed our fighter. It's not my fault they crit failed. Counter Element does have a prerequisite that you only have exactly one kinetic element. You can't be a dual gate. You can't have forked the path. You need to be a single specialized elemental kineticist. I don't know what this means if you take a second element after taking this feat. I don't know if that means you no longer qualify. Counter element is awesome in that you can counter not only a spell or magical effect, but even a hazard that has your associated elemental trait. You make a counteract check against it, and if you succeed, you are unaffected by the effects. On a normal success, 
you are completely unaffected. On a critical success, the ability does nothing at all. If you are in the area of a fireball as a fire kineticist, you succeed, you take no damage. You critically succeed, nobody takes damage. And once you're character level 12, on a normal success, you can redirect the damage to somebody within 30 feet. So that fireball's coming your way, you normal succeed. The fire warps around you, you collect it, and shoot it at an enemy within 30 feet. Hell, if the spellcaster is 30 feet away, you can redirect that back to the spellcaster, and they take the damage you would have taken. The way it's written, I do believe they get to make the saving throw. So if you redirect the fireball's damage, they do still get the reflex save. Fearsome Familiar is really cool. For three actions, you temporarily replace your familiar with a stronger elemental creature. The creature does need to be from the same elemental plane as your familiar and can be no higher than your level minus four, which is brutal. But you can think of this as somewhat free hit points on the battlefield. Your familiar trades places with this weaker elemental. The elemental fights, you can sustain it for up to one minute like a normal summon spell. If it runs out of hit points, your familiar just returns to the battlefield in its place. However, there is a slight limit on this in that your familiar can only stand the strain of this once per day. You can do it a second time, but if it dies again, your familiar dies as well. So that's a risk you might, well, actually, no, I think it's your familiar dies as soon as it returns. So even if you, if you use it a second time, you still get that familiar to fight for you, that creature. But even once you dismiss the spell, your familiar dies from the strain on its body and you're an awful person. Two Element Infusion is a free action that augments your next Elemental Blast. Your next Elemental Blast can be made of two different elements. You combine them and the damage is split in half. If you deal 12 damage, six will be one element, six will be the other, possibly triggering different weaknesses. Additionally, this counts as an impulse with both of those elemental traits, meaning if you have something like the Critical Blast Junction of both elements, on a critical hit, you will trigger both critical effects or both junction effects. There's a lot of ways to manipulate this. At first face value, it doesn't seem that great outside of just really cool flavor, like throwing a flaming ball of ice at somebody. But I think you could you could min max this a little bit to get some crazy effects. Level eight for single gate kineticists, they can take elemental overlap. Once again, prerequisite, you can only have a single element in your repertoire, but you get to gain any compound impulse that includes your element, even if you don't channel the other element. I really love this feat, giving single gate kineticists a way to get access to compound impulses without fully forking the path and getting rid of their single specialization. That's awesome. Purify element at level eight. I just can't recommend it. It's super specific, and I can't think of a whole handful of situations where it would be level eight game changing. For two actions, you purify one cubic foot of an element you can channel. The most obvious example of this would be water. You could purify eight gallons of water. It removes toxins, pollutants. I guess if you really want to be the hero of a city, or I guess even for an NPC, it would be very cool if an NPC in like a struggling town was a water kineticist who was purifying, you know, eight gallons of water every five seconds. That's kind of a cool idea to make sure the town stays hydrated when their water source is, you know, putrefied or unhealthy. But as a player, purifying one cubic foot of element for anything besides water is rough. It says, like, if you're earth, you can push and pull roots away. So I guess if you found, like, a cool treasure chest that was wrapped around roots underground. Well, no, cause I guess you could do that if you were metal. I don't know. This is a really weird feat. I don't know. I don't even know how you purify fire. I don't know. Uh, if something is being magically impurified, you actually have to make a counteract check against it to remove that magical taint. Aura shaping. Now, when you channel your element and gain your kinetic aura, rather than it always being a 10-foot emanation, you can choose to shrink it to 5 feet or extend it to as wide as a 20-foot emanation, which, remember, an emanation is 20 feet in all directions, so that is 40 feet across in a circle. That is massive on the battlefield. Additionally, anytime you use a stance impulse, you can choose to shrink or grow your aura again, and then at levels 15 and 20, your max emanation increases by 5 feet again, meaning a level 20 kineticist with this feat can increase their aura to a 30-foot emanation. That's huge. Chain infusion is incredible 
against a bunch of low-level enemies. For one action, you augment your next elemental blast, and then you make that attack roll. If it hits a target, you can make another elemental blast using that first target as the new base and using the range increment as usual. So if you've got a 60-foot range, you hit a target 60 feet away. If you hit, you can then target another creature up to 60 feet away from the original target. And you can do this up to five times, hitting five separate creatures all with an elemental blast. Now, there's a, some big caveats to this. The first and biggest red flag is that multiple attack penalty applies as normal. So you're going to hit with an elemental blast and then minus five on the second one and then minus ten on every other elemental blast. And if any of them miss, your chain is done. Also, you can't hit the same creature more than once, so you can't hit target one, two, one, two, one. Like, it'd be cool to see it ping pong back and forth between them, but you cannot do that either. Also, if you start with a melee blast, the melee strength bonus damage only applies to the first target, not the targets afterwards. So this is a feat that sounds really cool in theory, but overall, I just feel like it's gonna maybe hit twice and then you're done. Because attacking with a minus 10, unless the enemies are like five levels lower than you, it's not gonna do great. I also don't know how this interacts with the weapon infusion. I think you can only have one infusion at a time because they specifically say, if your next action is to do an elemental blast, then even weapon infusion, even though it's a free action, is still an action. So you wouldn't get the chain infusion because you weapon infusioned afterwards, negating your chain infusion. So you can't get the agile trait on your blast that way. It's kind of unfortunate. So chain infusion, really cool idea, really poor implementation. Elemental transformation. Once per day for one action, you can cast the elemental form spell heightened to a rank up to half your level. Simple as that. You can only do this weirdly when your gate is not activated. So you cannot be channeling an element when you do this, but you do just get to turn into an incarnation of your element. And once again, unfortunately for this one, the prerequisite is exactly one kinetic element. So you can only take this as a single gate, not as a dual gate or more. It's fine. Elemental form is cool. If you want to be a person who turns into a big magma person, Cool, more power to you, and I like that this is one of those rare feats that just gets stronger as you level up, because the elemental form is always going to keep getting a higher rank uh, as your level increases. Level 12, Effortless Impulse, we see this on almost all spellcasters, and now the Kineticist. As a free action, when your turn begins, you can sustain an impulse. Level 14's Nourishing Gate. You no longer rely on the normal mortal means of survival, your personal elemental gate gives you everything you need to live. First off, you get a plus two status bonus to saving throws against poisons, sleeps, and effects that would make you paralyzed. You no longer need to eat, sleep, or breathe. Oh my god, you no longer need to breathe. Uh, the only thing is you do need to meditate for eight hours every day, attuning to your gate, but you no longer need to sleep. Your level 14 kineticist is now the permanent party watchman. Rapid reattunement. Now, aside from only being able to reflow elements during your daily preparations, you can spend 10 minutes to do it whenever. Whenever you want, you can 10 minutes swap a feat as often as you want. And then at higher levels, when you get double reflow, you can do two feats for 10 minutes, whenever you want. That's crazy customization of feat selection. Level 16's Imperious Aura. As a free action, if you have a stance impulse in your feats, you can enter that stance as a free action at the start of your turn, every single turn. So if you've got multiple stances, then as a free action, every single turn, you can change between stances whenever you want. Though keep in mind, this only works for stance impulses that affect your aura. If you're thinking about dual classing with a monk, sorry, it's not going to work for monk stances. Elemental Apotheosis. If you are still at level 18, a single pure gate kineticist, and you have the nourishing gate feat as a prerequisite for some reason, you become part elemental. You gain the elemental trait and the trait associated with your element. You also gain dark vision if you don't have it already, and all speeds associated with an element of your type. This is based on the elemental form spell, so like air elemental form gains a fly speed, meaning at level 18, an air kineticist with elemental apotheosis has permanent flight. 
20th level, Kinetic Pinnacle. You are permanently quickened and can use the extra action only to one action elemental blast, use a one action stance impulse, or perhaps the least useful channel element. But remember the level 19 class feature? Remember how level 19 you automatically free action channel elements anyway? Not just at the beginning of encounters, at the beginning of your turn. You automatically channel element if it's not already channeled. So Kinetic Pinnacle saying you can channel element with your quickened action, well, okay. It's hard to say if it's useless or not. Let me paint a picture for you. I have not gone over them yet, but there are impulses known as overflow impulses. I was going to wait to go over them later, and I still will when we get to the actual impulses section of the video, but any impulse with the overflow trait ends the channeling of your element. These are usually two or three actions, and they're a massive game-changing effect, but you will need to re-channel your elements on the next turn. I suppose with Kinetic Pinnacle, you can start of your turn free action channel, then three action overflow, and then one action quickened channel again to keep your aura up. That's the only real benefit of this feat I can see, because on the following turn, you would just auto channel again, but you wouldn't get the aura effect during that turn, so... Kinetic Pinnacle, most of the time, is going to let you channel to keep your aura going beyond the end of your turn with a three action overflow. If that sounds useful to you at level 20, choose Kinetic Pinnacle. Otherwise, maybe something else. Because remember that the one action elemental blast will also happen automatically when you channel elements. Omnikinesis. If you really, really just want to be able to change your feats on the fly, then at level 20, for one action, you can reflow elements. Swap any feat with any other feat. You have double up reflow, you can swap two at once for one action as often as you want. If you're already channeling something and you're like, oh shoot, I forgot to get my two action rocks fall impulse. Omnikinesis, now I have it, rocks. <laughs> cool? <laughs> I feel like the amount of research it would take on a turn by turn basis to make Omnikinesis worthwhile is so unfun, I would never want to use it. But hey, if you want to be able to use literally every single impulse available to your class at the drop of a hat, cool, take Omnikinesis. And there you have all of the universal class feats available to any kineticist regardless of their chosen elements, with some of them reserved for single gates. At this time, we have covered 10 pages of the kineticist. We still have 14 to go, strap in, because it's time for Chapter 3. When expanding the portal as an air gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Your elemental blast critical hits now push targets up to 10 feet. You gain resistance to all damage with the air and electricity traits. Your aura now grants yourself and any ally that starts their turn in it a 10 foot status bonus to land speed and fly speed if applicable, skill proficiency in stealth and the experienced smuggler skill feat, or the level one single gate air junction. Wow, this shirt does not fit, but it's the airiest shirt I've got. So the next seven chapters of this video are going over all of the unique elemental impulses available to each element. You now know everything about the base class, how it works, all its class features, and the universal class feats available to any kineticist. The rest of this is basically describing the subclasses and the abilities available to those seven subclasses. Well, six plus compound. So strap in, because we're about to read a whole lot of feats. The level one air impulse, air boomerang, is your classic, just here's some damage impulse. For two actions, you throw out a 2d4 slashing line of air. Everything in the 60 foot line must make a reflex save against your class DC, and in the final square of the line, it's actually going to sit in place until the end of your next turn, upon which it is going to return to you. Now, you do have to spend one action to get it to return to you, but it's basically two actions to throw it out this turn, and then one action to bring it back on the following turn, and it deals its damage again on the way back. Plus, any creature who ends their turn in the square that the boomerang stopped in also takes the damage and makes the reflex save again. 
So even though it doesn't do a whole bunch of damage, only 2d4, this is a really fun way to play with geometry in that you throw out a line for two actions, and in a perfect world, if you don't have to move, you can just throw it out two actions, next turn, first action, bring it back, two actions, throw it out, next turn, one action, bring it back. It's great. However, you might have to move, in which case you can't throw it back out immediately, but the ability to move to reorient the line so it still hits the enemy and pulls it back for one action, that's fantastic. You can always get the perfect line with the aerial boomerang every time. And the damage increases by 1d4 every two character levels, so not a ton, but if you hit three enemies at level one, that's 6d4 slashing damage, granted on a reflex save. Air Cushion. As a reaction, if a creature within 60 feet of you is currently falling, you can slow their descent to a non-painful speed. And as long as they hit the ground within the next minute, they take no damage. And even if they don't hit the ground within a minute, any distance they fell before and during your air cushion's effect doesn't count to their total distance fallen. So if they're falling, I don't know, you cast it, they flutter down and they fall 10 feet after it wears off, they only take 10 feet worth of damage. At character level 8, the range doubles, and you can use it on 5 creatures at once, which means you and your party can jump off a cliff, and you can time it right that all 5 of you just slow your descent right at the end. 4 wins is... Uh, I can't recommend it. It's fine. For 2 actions, you target 4 creatures. All of those creatures can stride up to half their speed, or if they have a fly speed, fly up to half their fly speed. Granted, it doesn't use their reaction. So if you need to help your barbarian and your fighter and your rogue get into position, you know, you can spend two of your actions to help push them forward into the fray, but that's all it does. And it's only half their speed, so it's usually only going to be 10 feet, maybe 15 if they have a 30 foot move speed. Does two actions, Move four allies 10 feet sound like a good ability. Situationally, I suppose so. You do get to take multiple feats. You'd like, it's important to note, you know, this is not your one spell per day or anything like that. You can use this as much as you want and you have other abilities. Having that in the back pocket, is that useful? I suppose so. The problem is the initial 30 foot range. Is that means you need to be within 30 feet of them but I suppose if an enemy has reach or an enemy just took a step backwards away from your allies, you can save them the action to move up to the enemy by pushing them 10 feet forward effectively. Did judge for yourself if you think it's worth it. Whisper on the Wind. This is a one action impulse with the same effect as the message spell, though it has a range of 500 feet. At character level four, it has a range of a mile. And at range of 14, the range is planetary and the entire plane of air. So it's super distance message on steroids. You also don't even need to be able to see them. You just need to know their location. It's cool, you know? This is great for if you need to like help someone out in like a romantic situation, you're hiding behind the wall telling them what to say, even though you're a kineticist with eight uh, charisma, but don't worry about it. Though it is cool that the target needs to be surrounded by air. If they're underwater, you can't use this. Level 4, Air Shroud, is our first example of an impulse stance for one action. First off, as long as you're in this stance, no matter where you are, creatures in your area of effect have air to breathe. Even if you're underwater, it doesn't displace matter, but it does provide air. So those big ol' air bubbles, like Sonic style, that your allies can just swim into and just... to keep breathing underwater as long as they're in your emanation. Additionally... Your emanation is now difficult terrain for flying creatures, and any ranged attack that passes even through one square of your aura takes a minus one circumstance penalty to the attack roll. So if you can take it, standing between an archer and like your squishy cleric or something is great, because whether they shoot you or the cleric, it's taking a minus one. Lightning Dash is our first example of an overflow Impulse. You can see the overflow trait amongst all those crazy traits on this feat. What that means is after using it, you are no longer considered channeling your element and your aura dissipates. So any passive or abilities you have, any stances that regard your kinetic aura, all disappear until you channel elements again. Now, the trade-off is that these are usually much more powerful abilities, and Lightning Dash is a great example of that. 
For two actions, you turn into a living lightning bolt that travels in a straight 30 foot line, shocking everything you pass through. And this does not trigger any movement based attacks of opportunity, reactive strikes, and everything you pass through makes a reflex save against 2d12 electricity damage. So this gets you out of the way without triggering reactions, and it deals damage at the same time. Technically, you can even do this straight up or diagonal. If there is a 15 foot high wall, I'm not doing the math of the actual distance of, I'm not gonna do Pythagoras theorem, but if you can shoot 30 feet diagonally, you can just appear up on top of that cliff. And if you pass through like a bird or something, now you have dinner. Interestingly, this scales every three character levels. So it's gonna scale at level seven, 10, 13, 16, and 19. The damage goes up by 1d12 and the range increases by five feet, meaning that at really high levels, you zoom in. Clear as air at level six is another overflow, but a very good one for getting out of dodge. For two actions, you turn invisible. You become as clear as the air itself. And even though you're Channeled elements fade, you can still sustain this up to one minute. Obviously, any hostile action does end it as per usual invisibility, and there is a 10 minute cooldown where you can still use this feat again, but it'll only make you concealed instead of invisible if you use it within 10 minutes because you just can't, you're too weakened by it. At level 10, this upgrades in that the impulse does not end when taking a hostile action, but you do become concealed instead of fully invisible. But remember that concealed is still a flat 20% mischance on everything targeting you. And then at level 16, you can just stay invisible for the full minute. Take as many hostile actions as you want. Enemies are gonna be off guard against all of your attack rolls. Fantastic, one full minute of invisibility. Flinging Updraft is a weird one. For two actions, you choose a creature and they jump 30 feet in any direction. Could be straight up, could be diagonally, could be straight forward. If it's a willing creature, they just do it. They just jump 30 feet. But you can also make an enemy jump and they make a reflex save. If they fail, they move 15 feet. If they crit fail, they move all 30 feet. What's unclear is who chooses the direction. I think you, the kineticist, choose the direction, but it says the target jumps in any direction. So it's very, very unclear. I guess forcing the enemy to move is fine. I can't tell if it triggers reactions because jump is not an action. Jump, you know, there's leap and long jump and high jump, but this just says you make the creature jump. The cool thing is that every two character levels, the distance increases by 15 feet, which is crazy. At level 18, you can make anyone jump 120 feet in any direction, including straight up. Cyclonic Ascent is basically already near permanent flight. For two actions, you give yourself a fly speed equal to your land speed or 30 feet if that is faster. Additionally, you can fly straight up without treating it as difficult terrain. Also, also, normally a flying creature needs to spend one action taking the fly action to move and stay airborne. But as long as you used an air impulse that turn like an elemental blast, that counts as your action to stay flying. And once you're character level 14, you can give up to five additional creatures a 30 foot fly speed, though they don't get the other benefits. Just crazy to think that as long as you figure out how far one round of falling is, <laughs> it can wear off. You can fall that distance, and as long as you don't hit the ground at the start of your next turn, you can Cyclonic Ascent again, and then you have a fly speed, and for your last third action, you just fly again and reset yourself. So, like, it's a very rare case where this puts you in danger. Storm Spiral, a three action overflow impulse. These are the big effects that every element has a few of. And because they're three actions, that means, you know, you're going to stop channeling your element. You're going to lose your kinetic aura. And that's all three of your turn's actions. You're going to have to wait till next turn to even channel your element again. But they're almost always worth it. Like with Storm Spiral, you choose a 20 foot burst, not area, but burst, that is 20 feet in all directions from the corner of a square. Targets inside make a reflex save against your class DC, basic reflex save, against 3d12 electric damage and 1d10 sonic damage. If they fail their save, they are deafened for a round. Critical fail is deafened for a minute. And if they're wearing anything metal or they're made of metal, they take a minus one penalty to their saving throw. This damage only scales every three character levels, which 
that feels a little bit weak. It only goes up by 1d12 every three character levels, so 11, 14, 17, and 20. But it's still a huge area. It's a ton of damage. Uh, I wish the sonic damage scaled too. That stays at 1d10. But overall, massive AoE electricity damage. What's there to complain about? Ghost in the Storm is a wild stance impulse. For one action, you enter this stance and you gain a plus two status bonus to reflex saves and acrobatics checks. Additionally, any ally in your kinetic aura also gains that plus two status bonus and any affected creature that is you and your allies in your aura whenever any of you take a move action you become concealed until the start of your next turn and all of your strikes gain the shock rune for bonus electric damage that is so cool your rogue and your fighter and your barbarian just charge through your aura or I guess they technically have to start in your aura and use the move action while inside of it, but the 20% mischance, the bonus damage, that's so cool. They lose the reflex save and acrobatics bonus when they leave the aura, but they keep the concealment. I love this stance. Wiles on the Wind is cool, but a little bit weak for level 12. You create a sound coming from a square within 500 feet, which is a really long distance. And it can be as loud as four humans talking. And the strongest point is that it can be as intricate as you like. You can create four distinct voices having a conversation. Though if you make it too intricate, it does say the GM has full rights to make you make a check of some kind like diplomacy or deception or something like that to make it convincing any creature you choose within 40 feet of the illusion must make a will saving throw against your class dc on a failure they're fascinated for one round until the end of its next turn and on a critical failure they're fascinated by it for one minute now let me do some checking real quick i do believe fascinated was buffed in the remaster yeah, it's about the same. The best upgrade to Fascinated is that it prevents spell casting against most creatures as because you're so focused on what's distracting you, you can't focus to get a spell out against somebody else. So maybe you could drop this like against a spellcaster and run away, but otherwise Wiles on the Wind is very, very niche, but you can use it as often as you want, which needs to be taken into consideration. It's not an overflow. You can use this whenever you want even in roleplay. Body of Air is interesting in that it's a niche impulse, though it is overflow, that can be used as a reaction or for two actions on your own turn. This grants you the benefits of Vapor Form and can be sustained for up to five minutes. Vapor Form is tough because you lose all of your item bonuses to armor class, though you do gain resistance eight to physical damage and immunity to precision damage. It also gives you a fly speed of 10 feet, but that item bonus loss to armor class is really brutal. This basically gives you a turn of some minor damage resistance, but you need to be able to slip through a crack. It does say while in this form, you can slip through the smallest crack in a window or a wall or something like that to get away, but otherwise, if you're looking at a loss of item bonus, even just with light armor, if you're level, what level is this? Level 14? You probably have plus two armor at that point. Even if that's just leather, you're looking at losing three armor class when you use this ability. If they just normal hit you, that's some decent damage reduction, minus eight, especially immunity to precision damage. But if that turns it into a crit, you're taking even more. The nice thing is every single character level increases that resistance by one. So at level 20, it's going to give you 14 damage resistance. But another problem with this is you lose the ability to start fighting. This is an overflow, which means it ends your aura. If you channel elements and ignite your kinetic aura again, vapor form ends, even if you sustain it. So I'm not a big fan of this one just because of the AC penalty. All right, welcome to the level 18 and 20 impulse feats. This is going to prove true for every single chapter going forward. Um, these are named like Japanese RPG finishing moves, limit breaks, whatever. They're insane, and I love you for doing it, Paizo. Starting with Crowned in Tempest's Fury. This is a stance. While in this stance, any creature that ends its turn in your aura just takes 2d12 electricity damage, or if they enter it. I'm really curious, correct me in the comments, if you move into someone's space, you move next to someone, does that count as them entering your aura? I think it does, which means you move through them, they just get struck by lightning, and that is not a reflex save! 
That is just 2d12 electric damage every time they enter the aura, every time they end their turn there. Additionally, if you took Cyclonic Ascent at level 8, you just get the effects of Cyclonic Ascent when you enter Crowned in Tempest Fury. Even if you don't have Cyclonic Ascent, you still get a 20-foot fly speed. Also, plus 10-foot status bonus to all your speed, so it's a 30-foot fly speed even without Cyclonic Ascent, and all of your Elemental Blasts deal an additional 1d12 electricity damage. Oh my god, this stance is incredible. And finally for air, we have the 3-action Overflow Impulse, Infinite Expanse of the Bluest Heavens. You make every creature within a 20-foot burst within 100 feet of you make a will save. On a normal success, they're flat-footed. They're off guard for as long as you sustain this spell. This can be sustained up to one minute of just permanent off guard. Now, level 20, that's whatever. But if they fail, they become fleeing from the illusion. But every time they take an action to flee, they have a 50% chance to just run to another spot within the burst because they don't know where they're going because this illusion has tricked their minds into thinking they are falling forever and they're trying to escape this void of infinite falling. As long as they keep failing this 50-50 check, they will just keep needlessly and meaninglessly running within the area of the effect. However, once they exit the effect of the illusion, they become immune for one hour. So I guess it's good if you can target like six creatures at once with this and hopefully they'll either all mess up one action, maybe even two actions, but losing their whole turn is a little bit less likely on 50-50 coin flips. But hey, if they just waste all three actions rolling less than an 11 every single time, they lost their entire turn on a basic failed save. There is no critical failed effect, but pretty cool. Level 18, so I don't know if I like it that much at this high level, but it is pretty cool. Holy cow, we're done chapter three. Oh god, that means we still have to do. Chapter four, Earth. Oh. Ah! When expanding the portal as an Earth Gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Critical strikes with your elemental blasts knock your target prone if they're on the ground, or if they're in the air, they automatically descend up to 20 feet. Elemental resistance to damage with the earth and poison traits. Squares in your kinetic aura are difficult terrain for your enemies, but only if moving into the square would make them farther from you. Train proficiency in the athletic skill and the hefty hauler skill feat, or the level 1 single gate earth junction. The earth impulse is heavily focused on area of effect damage and personal defense. It's a lot of fun, and this is the element that I actually have personal experience playing with. I am running a gnome earth single gate kineticist, and I can confidently say it's pretty damn fun. Armor in Earth. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is one of those impulses which can actually give you an armor proficiency higher than light armor. For one action, you become encased in stone. This is treated as medium armor and uses your highest armor proficiency. So even though you're only trained in light armor, it still uses that proficiency even though this is considered medium. It has pretty much the same statistics as a breastplate. And once you hit character level three, it upgrades all the way to, I believe, half plate statistics as it gives a plus five AC bonus and plus one from dex and the bulwark armor trait. It's also considered heavy armor, which still uses your light armor proficiency. There's only one big holdback to this feat, and that is the speed penalty and strength requirement. You do not get to ignore that 16 strength requirement because you are still covered in rocks. So this is great for your 16 strength, 18 constitution earth impulse kineticist, which is exactly what I'm playing, and it feels fantastic. But keep in mind, even if you make the strength requirement, that only reduces the speed penalty by five feet, so you still will be taking a net minus five foot movement speed while wearing armor in earth. But you couple armor in earth with a solid shield, and even with only trained proficiency in armor, you're gonna have a crazy good armor class. 
Additionally, if you have any runes inscribed on your current armor or traveler's clothes, if they could also apply to the stone armor, they're automatically transferred to it when you use armor in Earth. Obviously, any item bonus you were getting from your current armor would be negated. So if you're wearing leather armor with a plus one rune and you use armor in Earth, you lose the item bonus from your leather armor, but that plus one does get put onto your stone armor as well. It's also just really satisfying to say, hey, for one action, I increase my armor class by five. Geologic Attunement is a one action stance, meaning right when you channel your element, you can enter it instead of making an elemental blast. When you do so, you gain imprecise tremor sense within your kinetic aura, and without any other feats, that is only a 10 foot emanation. So you can tell if there is something within 10 feet of you, even if your other senses are blinded. And at character level 13, it does become precise, so you can point at a square and say, there, there's a mole underground five feet away from me. The other nice thing is you do get to use the point out action as a free action once per turn to point something out with your tremor sense. It's fine, but with the limited size of your aura, unless you take that universal feat that makes it way bigger, this isn't that useful. Though there are only a handful of ways to gain tremor sense in PF2, so it's not terrible. Stepping stones, a really fun roleplay feat and something that can come in handy a lot more often than you might think, especially if the rest of your party have strength scores of 12 or lower except for the fighter and can't freaking swim. Adolin. For two actions, you create a 20 foot bridge of stone stepping stones. Any creature can step and walk along these stones that can go over dangerous, difficult, hazardous terrain. You know, you can put them and have them hover over the surface of a river so your party doesn't have to swim across 20 feet of river. And you can even make them go vertical. Now vertically, they can only go half as high as they are long, but that still means you can give your, your little 10 strength cleric there a 10 foot ladder to get up a 10 foot cliffside that otherwise they maybe wouldn't be able to do by themselves. You know, a lot of GMs will hand wave this stuff, but it feels really good to be playing a kineticist and say, hey, we don't need to hand wave any of this. I can just make a ladder for my allies to climb. I did this in a recent session. It felt awesome. Even the fighter who probably could have made the climb checks was cool because they didn't have to bother rolling. They just got to walk up the ladder and every two character levels, you get an extra 10 feet of length or five feet of verticality. And that scales so fast. Already at level seven, I can make a 50 foot long bridge or a 25 foot high ladder for my allies to just walk up like stairs. And the only caveat is that all of the stepping stones need to be within a certain distance of you. They have to be within 60 feet at level one, and this goes up by a 10 foot distance every two character levels. Do not underestimate this feat. Stepping stones, fantastic. You will be your low strength party members best friend. Or at level one, if you just want to cause damage, you can take Tremor. This is a two action overflow impulse that just causes a mini earthquake in a 10 foot burst within 30 feet. You can think of this as a very mini level one fireball that deals bludgeoning damage. Basic fortitude save against your class DC, and if they critical fail, along with taking double damage, they do fall prone as well. This deals a base 1d8 bludgeoning damage, and scales weirder than anything I've ever seen. I thought this was a typo for the longest time, but even on Foundry, it works like this. The base damage is 1d8, and it scales by an additional 1d10 every two character levels. So at level seven, this deals 1d8 plus 3d10 for some reason. I don't know if the scaling is supposed to say 1d8, I don't know if the base damage is supposed to be 1d10, but I almost never have ever seen an ability whose damage scales with a different die size than its base damage. It's weird, but it's a really good feat. If you're fighting a bunch of enemies, you can always just channel, get that free elemental blast, tremor overflow. Next turn, channel, elemental blast, tremor overflow. Feels great. Level four, Calcifying Sand. It does have the incapacitation trait, but oh my god, this feat is metal. Well, it's actually earth, but it's a really, really cool effect, and sometimes people call that metal. If a creature damages you with a non-reach melee weapon or an unarmed strike, you can use your reaction to attempt to grab them with sand and turn their flesh to stone. 
First off, regardless, you gain resistance to physical damage equal to your level. So if you're level four when you take this, that just reduces the damage that you take from that attack by four. And then they make a fortitude save against your class DC. If they normal fail, they are slowed one until the end of their next turn. Keep in mind, that won't change their amount of actions this turn, but they will get two instead of three actions on the following turn. If they critically fail, they are instantly petrified until the end of their next turn. If this was their first action to attack you and they critically fail, they miss both of the rest of the actions this turn and all three of their actions on the following turn. And enough damage can shatter their petrified form, killing them instantly. And the only thing holding this back is that each individual creature can only trigger this once every 24 hours. Sure, it's a reaction, so you can only do it once per round, but if you're fighting five different creatures, then each round, if they hit you, you can calcifying sand each of them. Also, I forgot to mention it, but this is an overflow. So if you do use Calcifying Sand A, you need to have still had your Kinetic Aura active on your previous turn, and you will need to re-channel it on the following turn. Igneogenesis is fun, but it's not that much better than Base Kinesis or the other Universal class feat that gives you improved Base Kinesis. Basically, you can fill a five-foot square with a chunk of stone or earth. And if a willing creature is standing in that square, you can raise them five feet up with it. That's pretty cool, but you cannot do this to an unwilling creature. The object does last until you use Igneogenesis again, meaning if you create a five foot block of earth, it's just gonna sit there. Even if you don't use Igneogenesis for two days, it's just gonna sit there. However, if you do spend one full hour using Igneogenesis, you can make it permanent and non-magical. You magically mold the earth into its new shape and then make it permanent through a long process. The downside is that unless you make a crafting check, you can't do anything else with this block of earth. You just make a block of earth. And with a crafting check, you can't still give it intricate parts or any kind of mechanical use. You can just inscribe a symbol or maybe chisel a small design out of it. But at character levels 7, 10, 13, 16, and 19, it does get an additional five foot cube, meaning at level 19, you can make six five foot cubes of earth for two actions. The limitation there, though, is that all of the cubes must be contiguous, they must be touching another cube, but I guess if you can make it five foot, you could give yourself something to take cover behind? So for two actions, you can make a big, you know, 30 foot, five foot tall wall, and then you and your party members can just, like, duck under it? I don't know. It's an idea. I just don't see a lot of use for Igneogenesis when base Kinesis is right there. Sand Snatcher is one of the most unique feats I've ever read. For two actions, you create a small, quote-unquote, creature. These are long tendrils of s sand that animate from the ground in a space of your choice within 30 feet. Now, these fingers of sand can provide flanking and they can grapple targets. They get a free grapple attempt when you summon them, and each time you sustain the impulse, they can either move 20 feet with a burrow speed or a land speed, or grapple again. They use your impulse attack roll to grapple, which may or may not be that great against some targets, but at character levels 10 and 14, it does become a large and then huge creature, meaning they can grapple even the largest enemies in the game. Overall, it's really cool. I like being able to provide flanking for off guard and grappling to hold an enemy in place is always useful. And just the flavor of summoning sand tendrils that wrap around your enemy, that's just like mental trauma on an NPC you need to keep still, and I dig that. Weight of stone, rocks fall, everyone dies. That is the feat. This is a three action overflow impulse which causes rocks to fall in a massive 20 foot diameter, 80 foot height cylinder. It's a reflex save against your class DC or take 4d8 bludgeoning damage, and if they fail, they are pushed downward 40 feet if they're in the air. Additionally, if this causes a flying creature to hit the ground, they don't take any bonus damage, but they cannot fly or leave the ground again for one full round. So it's some decent air control. 
They're also pushed 80 feet on a critical failure. The problem here is that it does say they are pushed. They do not fall 80 feet. So if you weight of stone on a pterodactyl and it gets pushed 80 feet to the ground, I don't believe it's taking any fall damage, which is unfortunate. And it's sort of a problem because unless you are fighting specifically flying enemies, weight of stone is basically worse than Tremor. It's an extra action, meaning you can't channel your element and Weight of Stone on the same turn. It's gonna disable your aura until the next turn, and the damage scaling is actually weaker. By level six, Tremor is already dealing 1d8 plus 2d10, whereas Weight of Stone is only dealing 4d8. That's roughly the same amount of damage for an extra action. So, Weight of Stone, a lot more situational than you might think, but if you just love the flavor of rocks fall, everyone dies, I do recommend it. I used it once. I almost killed our fighter. It was hilarious. Level 8, Spike Skin. For two actions, you choose one willing creature, it does not need to be yourself, and earthen spikes protrude from their skin. Now, not only do they gain four resistance to all physical damage, but any creature that hits them with an unarmed strike or non-reach melee weapon just takes two piercing damage. And this is not sustained. This just lasts for 10 minutes. Both the resistance and the damage both scale by two every two character levels, meaning at level 20, you're getting 16 resistance and 14 piercing damage back to everything that hits them with an unarmed strike. The only limitation is you can only have one active at a time. So choose whether to give it to yourself or maybe your tank barbarian, but once it wears off on them, they are immune for one hour but that doesn't mean someone else is immune for one hour. So it's a really fun impulse if you like being able to deal a little bit of damage back. And there's no saving throw against this damage. If they hit you, they take the damage, which is nice. Swim through Earth, the ultimate get out of jail free card. For two actions, you gain a burrow speed equal to your land speed. You also get to immediately burrow once. So if you've got a 20 foot land speed and you cast Swim Through Earth, well guess what? You can burrow 20 feet in any direction underground. And if you had one action left this turn, that means you can go another 20 feet. The biggest thing holding this back is that you don't get to breathe underground. You do need to hold your breath. But remember, Kineticist is a constitution based class and the number of rounds you can hold your breath is based on constitution. I believe it's five rounds plus one round for your modifier. So if you have an 18 constitution, that is nine rounds of holding your breath, moving at least 60 feet per round. Good luck getting caught. You can sustain it up to one minute, so you do technically only get two actions per turn to move, not three, since you do have to sustain it. Uh, but if at any point you stop sustaining the spell, or one minute elapses and you're still underground, you do get shunted up out of the ground, you drop prone, and you are slowed one until the end of your next turn. Nice thing though, once you're character level 14, you don't even leave a trace when you burrow through the earth. You just like melt through the earth without even leaving a path. And I don't know how that makes sense. Earth magic, worms. Rattle the earth is okay. It is two action level 12 earthquake, but it is incredibly nerfed. First off, it has only got a range of your kinetic aura or a 60 foot cone. And this already sounds amazing, right? A 60 foot cone earthquake for two actions whenever you want as you overflow. Earthquake is not as powerful as I think a lot of people might think it is because earthquake on its own does not deal damage. Earthquake actually has three effects. First off, the entire area of it is turned into difficult terrain and reduces the armor class and attack rolls of all creatures on that terrain by minus two. That is amazing. If you can hit this on the enemies but not your allies, that is a huge nerf until they drag themselves out of that difficult terrain. The second effect is fissures. You create openings in the ground that creatures fall into and take fall damage but with this feat, the fissures are only 10 feet deep, so they're only taking 10 feet worth of fall damage. Now, the big damage of Earthquake comes from a collapse. If you use Earthquake and any kind of structure is in the area of effect, normally the DC is a 14 flat check to see if the entire structure comes down and deals 11 D6 damage to all creatures in the area, I believe on a basic reflex save. With the feet rattle the earth, it's only a DC 18 flat check, which means you have a three out of 20 chance of actually collapsing a structure. Now, 
there's no cooldown on this aside from the overflow. So if you want to, every turn you can channel rattle, channel rattle, until you get that 18 or higher and cause a 60 foot area of a building to collapse. And 11d6 damage at level 12, really, really good. But not that good on a 15% chance. Every four levels, the spell increases a little bit, getting deeper fissures and a more likelihood of collapse, and then only at character level 20 is the feat as good as the Earthquake spell, which is understandable. The spell is base level 8, which means spellcasters get it at 15, and you get the full effects at level 20, which can be spammed infinitely. Rock Rampart, three action overflow. I'm noticing Earth actually has a ton of overflow impulses because they're just such big effects. Uh, you get Wall of Stone, no spell slot. Just a overflow impulse, which again, because it's three actions, you can't do on the same turn that you channel, but you can just cast Wall of Stone with a length of 40 feet as often as you want. It does need to be sustained though. At character levels 16 and 20, you do get 10 feet extra length and five extra hit points per section of the wall. So it's good. Once again, very similar to the Earthquake feat, this is just a spell that normally costs a spell slot that you get to cast a slightly weaker version of as often as you want. And we'll see a lot of that as we keep going in the Kineticist. There will be feats that either replicate existing spells or have spell-like effects that are far weaker than a spell slot spell, but can just be used as often as you want. That's sort of the Kineticist cup of tea. Less options and weaker options than a spell caster, but infinite use. Level 14's Assume Earth's Mantle is another one action stance that you can enter right when you channel your element, and I'm just gonna read off this list because it gives you a lot. You become large if you were smaller and gain five feet of reach. You gain a climb speed equal to your land speed, but you can only climb things made of earth matter. You gain plus one circumstance to fortitude saves, plus two circumstance bonus to fortitude or reflex saves that attempt to shove you, trip you, or knock you prone. And if your strength is lower than plus four, it increases to plus four. Or if it was plus four already, you get a plus one. And additionally, if you already have the armor in stone impulse, you get all of the benefits of that when you assume Earth's mantle. So lots of little bonuses here. If you took armor in Earth at level one, you might as well take Earth's mantle at level 14 because it just makes it way better. Again, flat plus one to strength forever as long as you're in that stance. That's crazy good. Alternatively, level 18 gives a different stance, Rebirth in Living Stone, and this is actually a stance that is much more appealing for an Earth Kineticist not using armor in stone. And that's because when you enter this stance, you become made of stone itself, gaining 40 temporary hit points, and you are immune to critical hits and precision damage. Obviously, this isn't useless if you have armor and stone, but you can't use both. And if you don't have armor and stone, your armor class is obviously gonna be way lower, so this makes you immune to critical hits, so a lower armor class is far less of a problem. Additionally, as long as you're standing on stone or earth, you cannot be pushed, pulled, or tripped, and your elemental blasts deal 1d10 extra damage. The benefits last until the end of your next turn, but can be sustained up to a minute, and it is a little bit balanced in that you can re-enter this stance as often as you like, but you can only gain the temporary hit points once every 10 minutes, which is rough, but it means once per combat. Once per combat, you get 40 extra hit points and immunity to critical strikes. That's really, really good. Alternatively, you can just make a death zone with the Shattered Mountain Weeps. For a three action overflow, you create a 20 foot burst that deals 9d10 bludgeoning damage against a basic reflex save. At face value, that doesn't seem like much. But then you realize, first off, a normal fail knocks the target prone. And then, for the next minute, automatically not sustained, any creature who ends their turn in that zone takes another 3d10 bludgeoning damage. If you can combine rattle the earth for insane difficult terrain with then the shattered mountain weeps on another turn and they're just stuck in that area of difficult terrain being pummeled by rocks, you could stack up some serious damage. And at level 20, both the initial damage and the damage every turn both go up by 1d10. If you have a team that is focused on forced movement and holding creatures in place, or you're just fighting a creature so big that it can't get out of the area, remember, even if its little toe is still in the area, it takes the damage, this could stack up fast. 
So there's Earth Impulses. These are the ones I know the best. They're really, really cool. I think it's my personal favorite element just because I love the strength-based kineticist and Earth really supports that. But we've got a lot more to go, which leads us to... Chapter 5. Fire. When you choose to expand the portal as a fire gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Critical strikes with your elemental blasts inflict 1d6 persistent fire damage, and this persistent damage gains a damage bonus from the item bonus to your attack rolls, such as from the kineticist's gate attenuator item. Elemental resistance to damage with the cold and fire traits. Enemies within your kinetic aura gain weakness to fire from only your fire impulses. This weakness is equal to half your level. Trained proficiency in intimidation and the intimidating glare skill feat, or the level 1 single gate fire junction. Hey, do you like dealing damage? What about dealing damage and the ever so rare in PF2 dealing damage? Well, then is fire the element for you? And I mean, who can blame Paizo for designing it this way? Because fire destroys. It destroys, it burns, it incendiates. That's not a word. Let's talk about feats that do a lot of damage. Though starting off, Burning Jet does not deal any damage. For two actions, you shoot forward 40 feet in a straight line, and this movement does not trigger reactions. It also ignores difficult terrain, so it's just sort of a get out of dodge ability that scales Okay, at level 6, the distance increases and gives you the option to leap 40 feet instead. At first glance, that doesn't sound great, but remember that instead of a straight line, you can sort of go a curved 40 feet, which does take you upwards as well. Where this feat really takes off, the pun doesn't make sense yet because I haven't explained it, is level 10, where Burning Jet now, after using the leap option, does not cause you to fall instantly. And if you use Burning Jet again on the following turn, you still don't fall, and you leap another 40 feet from your current airborne position. So while this does not give you a fly speed, you can infinitely jump 40 feet around, blasting yourself off like a little mini rocket. Eternal Torch that also doesn't deal damage. Look, we'll get there. Eternal Torch is the light cantrip but you can cast it four times. You can have it active on four separate items where you put a little ball of flaming light on something and it circles the person or the item and it gives off the same amount of light as a torch. The light can be whatever color you choose and they have an unlimited duration. You can just turn them off whenever you feel like it, but otherwise they just last. And you can have a number of them equal to your constitution modifier, which is probably gonna be four, and then at level 10 it'll become five. And then at 8th level, I believe the distance of light doubles. Instead of 30 bright, 30 dim, it becomes 60 light, 60 dim. Interestingly, it doesn't say that you can choose to make them brighter. They just are. I don't know if that matters, but just an interesting little read. Flying Flame is the first impulse that deals damage, and it's just okay. For two actions, you shoot out a little moat of flame that you can flavor to be a little fireball, a little flaming phoenix, a little fiery arrow, and it shoots out in a 30-foot path. That's important to say. It's a path, not a line. So this thing can zig and zag as often as you want to a maximum of 30 feet. Now you can't hit any creature more than once, but this does mean if the creatures are laid out a little bit awkwardly, you can move this thing to hit each of them. The only downside is it only deals 1d6 damage on a basic reflex save. The damage does scale by 1d6 every two character levels, meaning it's always going to be okay. It's just a little unfortunate that it doesn't add your constitution modifier or anything to the damage. So it's going to be consistent. You can think of this as your go-to cantrip, but I guess if you think about it, if Electric Arc is considered a very good cantrip because it hits two targets for an average of six damage, then Flying Flame, you could probably position yourself to on average hit three, maybe even four targets for an average of three. 3.5 damage. Scorching Column, I feel like just kind of feels worse than Flying Flame. For a three action 
overflow, you choose a 10 foot diameter, 30 foot tall cylinder within 60 feet of you. So the 60 foot range is nice. All creatures within that cylinder, even if they're flying through it, make a reflex save against your class DC, once again, only against 1d6 fire damage. Now, it's cool because the flames do linger up to one minute if you choose to sustain it, and every time a creature moves through a square in that column of flickering flames, they take one more fire damage. The problem here is that it's only a 10-foot diameter, meaning it only covers four squares, meaning no matter which square they're currently standing in, they can just step out of it. This would be good on large creatures, as if they have to move square by square, they will take at least one damage moving through it just due to their sheer size. And unfortunately, I just can't recommend it because as the feat gets heightened, the area does not. Every three character levels, the base damage goes up by 1d6 and the flickering flame hazardous terrain damage goes up by two. So at character levels four, seven, 10, you know, by level 10, it's dealing seven damage when they step through it. I guess that's fine, but I feel like I'd rather just use Flying Flame to hit multiple creatures in a 30-foot path rather than just a couple of creatures in a 10-foot diameter. I really hate saying it because I love that they have support for verticality, but how often are you fighting enemies, especially that are only 20 to 30 feet off the ground? Blazing Wave is honestly the first feat for the Fire Kinesis that deals pretty decent damage and feels really good. This is Burning Hands, and like most Kineticists, you can just do this as often as you want. It is a two action over, I just punched you in the face, I'm so sorry. It is a two action overflow that deals 4d6 fire damage on a basic reflex save in a 30 foot cone. And because it's a two action overflow, once again, every single turn, you can channel elements, free elemental blast, 30 foot cone fire damage. Next turn, channel element, free elemental blast, 30 foot cone fire damage. Fan. Fantastic. And if they critically fail, along with taking 8d6 fire damage, they're also knocked prone. Really good. Damage goes up by 1d6 every two levels, so yeah. In a lot of cases, this will be better than Flying Flame, but if the enemies are sort of weirdly surrounding you rather than in a cone, Flying Flame can still be useful because you can send it out and have it fly in a circle around you, which is super cool. So I like that you can have Blazing Wave and Flying Flame, and they're both useful in their own situations, and, you know, Blazing Wave is an overflow while Flying Flame is not. There's, there's reasons to use either of them, and that's great. Thermal Nimbus is fascinating. This is the first stance for fire impulses, and entering it, you and your allies gain resistance to fire or cold damage. This damage resistance is equal to your level. So your level four, they get four damage resistance against fire or cold. Now, on top of that, all creatures in your aura take that same type of damage equal to half your level. So I think this is a really, really cool concept in that you're giving yourself and your allies four cold resist, but you're also dealing two cold damage to everybody around you. So your allies don't take that damage. Now, what's really fascinating, and this is the only example of it I've ever seen in Pathfinder 2E, is that Thermal Nimbus, for you specifically, is cumulative resistance, specifically with a gate junction. So if you choose the elemental resistance gate junction and you activate your thermal nimbus stance, it increases your inherent elemental resistance by thermal nimbus's amount. And that is the only time in PF2 I can think of with cumulative resistance. And I just think that's super unique. Crawling fire is really cool for positioning. For two actions, you summon a small little moat of flame crawling hand fire thingy anywhere within 30 feet. And when you use a fire impulse, you can choose to originate it from the hand itself. This is a cool way to give your elemental blast some extra reach or just be able to have multiple origin points to use your, your flaming hands thing or your flying flame. You know, fire has a lot of focus on positioning and areas of effect. And I think having the option to have two different positions of area of effect on the battlefield at a time is super cool. Now you do need to sustain this every turn, otherwise it wears off at the end of your next turn. But when you do sustain it, it can move up to 40 feet. So for one action, you move this thing 40 feet and then two actions flaming hands something, that feels great. Now there is a very heavy drawback with this. Your crawling flame uses your exact defenses, armor class, saving throws, all that jazz. And if it takes damage, 
you lose hit points. The good news is, this means your flaming hand does not die. The bad news is, if enemies keep hitting it, you will. <laughs> but luckily it works like a summoner's Eidolon. If you and the Crawling Flame are both stuck in the same area of effect, you only take the lowest result and take the damage once rather than twice. And as you grow in character level, you can actually choose to make the Crawling Hand bigger. At 8th level it can become medium, 10th level is large, and 14th level you can make it huge, which again, for positioning, you can or originate the impulse's origin from any square the Crawling Flame takes up, meaning you have incredible positioning options. Alternatively, you can take Volcanic Escape, which is much less exciting, but still incredibly useful. As a reaction, if an enemy within your aura damages you, you explode backwards. They make a reflex save against your class DC against 1d6 fire damage. I know, it's not a lot, but you do get to leap half your movement speed in any directions without triggering reactions. So if an enemy walks up to you, bonks you with a hammer, you explode 10 feet backwards, their third action is just spent catching up to you. And you can do this every single round. The only downside is it's overflow. So if your channeled element is not channeled, you can't use this when it's not your turn. Also, the damage scales like garbage. It only goes up by 1d6 every four character levels. So 2d6 at 10, 3d6 at 14, maxing out at 4d6 damage at level 18. Eighth level gives another stance at Kindle Inner Flames, and it's okay. For one action, you enter the stance, which you can do for free when you channel your elements, and you and all allies within your aura gain a plus one status bonus to reflex saves, and if they take a move action while in your aura, they get kindled in embers, meaning all of their attack rolls gain plus two fire damage. They also get that plus one bonus to their acrobatics checks and can take a step action for free every turn if they are in your aura, which means even if they have to, they can move into your aura, step for free, get kindled, get the plus two fire damage, move over to someone and bonk them on the head. Once your character level 12, the reflex and acrobatics bonuses increase to plus two, and instead of getting just a flat two fire damage, all their attacks gain the flaming rune effect. One thing I'm curious about to hear from you in the comments is how does this work? It says their strikes gain the flaming rune. If they don't have room on their weapon for an extra rune, does that count? Remember, you can only have as many property runes as your number fundamental rune. If you have a plus two weapon, you can have two rune effects on your weapon. If you already have two rune effects, does the flaming rune inhibit one of your other effects to use it. Curious to know. And here we have it. The level eight feat, which is the reason you will be playing a fire impulse kineticist. Potentially the reason you will be playing a single gate fire impulse kineticist. Solar detonation. Does free fireballs for life sound good? What about free fireballs that deal bonus damage to undead? What about free fireballs that deal bonus damage to undead and blind the targets? What about free fireballs that deal bonus damage to undead, blind the targets, and trigger sunlight vulnerabilities? And if you're a single gate fire kineticist, what about free fireballs that deal bonus damage to undead, blind the targets, trigger sunlight vulnerabilities, and deal d8s instead of d6s? Well, then you want Solar Detonation. It is a three action overflow, meaning it can only be used every other turn, but it deals 6d6 fire damage in a 20 foot burst, 2d6 vitality damage to creatures that are weak to it, blinds on a failure, blinds for a minute on a critical failure, dazzles on a success, and triggers vulnerability to sunlight in creatures like vampires. The damage scales by 1d6 every two character levels, just like the fireball spell does with spell ranks. This is insane. If you're a single gate fire kineticist fighting a horde of undead at level eight, that is 6d8 plus 2d6 vitality damage every other turn, infinitely. No spell slots. It's just always there, as long as you keep your element channeled. There's nothing else to say about it. Like that is, it is such a crazy effect. The only drawback is that they are immune to the blinding and dazzling for 10 minutes, regardless of their save. 
Architect of Flame at level 12 lets you cast Wall of Fire infinitely every other turn if you choose to, and the damage scales up by 1d6 every three character levels, though it can never get longer. It will always be 10 feet long, 60 feet high, and if things move through it, they take a bunch of fire damage. It's the Wall of Fire spell. Furnace Form for two actions basically lets you cast the Fiery Body spell. As a reminder, this replaces your physical form with fire. You gain resistance 10 to precision damage, but weakness 5 to water and cold damage. Any creature that touches you or hits you with an unarmed strike or non-reach melee weapon does take 3d6 fire damage in retaliation. However, with this version of the spell, you do not get the ignition ability that usually comes with the fiery form spell. While in this form, your fire elemental blasts do deal an extra die of damage, but you do have to sustain it every turn to keep it up. Though, while in this form, you have a 40-foot fly speed, and when you sustain it, you can fly half your speed as part of the same action. So, it's really good. It's fiery form with a lot of little caveats to keep track of, but overall, it's infinite. It makes your fire impulses better, or at least your fire elemental blast better. It lets you fly. It's great for positioning. And fire impulses are all about positioning. Once your character level 16, it actually just gets a duration of one minute and does not need to be sustained any longer. Walk Through the Conflagration is thematic as hell. For two actions, unfortunately Overflow, which I think makes it a little bit weaker, you can teleport to any fire within 120 feet, which that's already good. That's a two action, 120 foot teleportation. And either where you leave or where you show up, you explode in a gout of flame, dealing 4d6 fire damage on a basic reflex save against your class DC. This hits all the creatures adjacent to you where you leave or arrive. Now you do have to pick if it's on arrival or departure. You don't get to hit both. And the damage scale is pretty weak. Only 1d6 bonus fire damage every three character levels. And since you take this level 14, it's going to max out at 6d6. So you become a sort of low level fireball, but it comes with a built-in teleport. It's really good. I personally don't think this needed overflow because there needs to be an existing fire somewhere else anyway and a creature needs to be next to that fire to begin with. It's very specific to get it off, so having it be overflow is unfortunate. What is nice is a creature suffering from persistent fire damage does count as a flame you can teleport to. At level 18, All Shall End in Flames is a bigger, stronger fireball, because this is fire and fire just explodes, with a very interesting bonus effect. This deals 13 d6 fire damage with a reflex save against your class DC with a 500 foot range of either a 30 foot burst or a 30 foot emanation as you detonate yourself and you take the damage too. That sounds like it sucks, right? Maybe not. Because if you die by this effect, you instantly come back to life with double your level in hit points. What's important to note is any creature, including player characters, who die by All Shall End in Flames do not get death saves. If you drop to zero hit points, you are incinerated. But if you can kill yourself with this, you come back with 36 hit points at level 18 not wounded, so if you had less than 36 hit points, it's almost worth it to get yourself into the fray, explode, deal a bunch of AoE damage, kill yourself, and come back with more health and no wounded condition. And then at level 20, the damage goes up by 2d6. Alternatively, if you don't want to die, Ignite the Sun is so crazy. For two actions, you create a 5-foot First, miniature sun that gives off bright light in 500 feet emanation. This does trigger sunlight vulnerabilities in creatures. A creature takes 7d6 fire damage, quote, any time it's in the miniature sun. And when you sustain this spell, you can move the sun 30 feet in any direction and increase its size by 5 feet. The only caveat is that a creature can only take damage from a sun once per turn. But even on your second turn, this is a 10-foot burst moving 30 feet per turn when you sustain it. Also, this is not an overflow, and there is a sentence at the end of this feat that leads me to believe you can get very creative with this. The sun continually channels fire into you and your allies. You and each of your allies within the 500-foot bright light deal an additional 1d6 fire damage with all strikes, 
fire spells, and fire kineticist impulses. These are not cumulative with multiple suns. You know what that means? For two actions, you ignite the sun. On your next turn, one action sustain the current sun, two actions make another sun. Then on future turns, just one action, sustain each one, move it around, and you are suddenly making two, getting bigger and bigger suns, just running over enemies. It's like, I think D&D has a spell called Flaming Sphere. It's like that on steroids as you are just ping pong ball moving around, running over enemies, and dealing constant fire damage. It's a really fun idea, which gives you one extra action per turn to do whatever you want. Uh, I love the idea of just multiple suns rolling around the battlefield, lighting people on fire. That's fun. Fire is fun. I like it. Okay, that's chapter five, which means we have to move on to... Chapter six. Metal. When you choose to expand the portal as a metal gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Critical strikes with your elemental blasts inflict 1d6 persistent bleed damage, or if the target creature is made of metal, they instead take 1d6 persistent untyped damage from rust. This persistent damage gains an item bonus equal to the item bonus to your attack rolls, such as from the kineticist's gate attenuator item. Elemental resistance to damage with the electricity and metal traits. Enemies within your kinetic aura take a minus one status penalty to attacks made with metal objects, and if they are wearing metal armor or are made of metal, they take a minus one status penalty to armor class. Trained proficiency in the crafting skill and the quick repair skill feat, or the level one single gate metal junction. So metal impulses are weird. Metal doesn't feel like it has much of an identity. Its identity is dealing a lot of different damage types, mainly piercing, slashing, and electricity. I like that Paizo has leaned into metal, you know, being incredibly hyperconductive, and another thing it gets is a lot of bonuses against creatures wearing or made of metal. All that being said, I'm not a big fan of these abilities, but to each their own. Let's start with Flash Forge for two actions. This is an impulse that lets you create any level zero weapon or piece of adventuring gear either in your own hands or the hand of a willing creature within 30 feet. This is cool. You know, in certain situations, whether your ally's been disarmed or maybe you've been kidnapped, you know, it's very common, like, below level three to be captured in a campaign, removed of all your equipment, you are alone in a jail cell. Well, you start a jailbreak, and normally everyone has, like, improvised weapons, maybe a shiv. You can look at your fighter and go, flash forge any one bulk or lower weapon. Have a short sword. I think a long sword is one bulk. There's a lot of options out there. You can even make things like a compass or a scale or apparently even a lock. The downside of these items is that they always have a 20% chance of breaking. DC5 flat check after every single time the item is used means eventually it's going to shatter. Now, it's not an overflow. If your fighter's greatsword breaks, you can give them another one on your turn. It's okay. My biggest complaint with this feat is that it does not scale. You know, the item level that you can make does not get any better. Whether you're a level 1 kineticist or a level 20 metal kineticist, the items you can make with Flash Forge never get any better, last longer, or anything like that. I think that is a missed opportunity. Metal does get what I believe is one of the single strongest level 1 kineticist feats in the game, and that is Magnetic Pinions. It is a 3-action overflow, so you can only use it every other turn, but you make 3 attack rolls against any 3 enemies within 30 feet. 60 feet? Oh my god, it's 60 feet. Additionally, if any of the targets are wearing or made of metal, you get a plus 1 circumstance bonus to your impulse attack roll. And you make all 3 of these attacks at your full bonus. Your multiple attack penalty does not increase until after you have made all three of these attacks, and each attack deals 1d4 piercing and 1d4 bludgeoning damage. And the damage scales incredibly well. The damage goes up by 2d4 every two character levels. The bludgeoning and piercing both go up by 1d4. So by level nine, this is already dealing 10d4 
per target. If you land a normal hit at level 9 with magnetic pinions on 3 targets, you're dealing 30 d4. It's a great ability. Unfortunately, in my opinion, one of the last great metal abilities, but we'll move on and see what you think. Metal Carapace works very similarly to the Earth Impulse Armor in Earth, and as it gives you a suit of medium armor that scales with your light armor proficiency. It gives you an item bonus of 3 and a max dex bonus of plus 2. So if you were going for like a 14 dex, 18 con kineticist, this is a really good feat to have as it will maximize your potential armor. Now, rather than having the insane armor bonus of the Earth Armor, the Metal Armor actually also gives you a free rusty metal shield that comes with the shield shield block feat. As a reminder to people, not any character can shield block. You need to have a general feat or be one of the few classes who start with it. Kineticist does not start with shield block, but if you are wielding a shield made by Metal Carapace, you can shield block with it and reduce damage. Additionally, this shield counts as a free hand for using your impulses. I don't think I've actually said it once this video, but in order to use a kineticist impulse of any kind, you do need a free hand. Now, if you have a sword for some reason in one hand and the carapace shield, that still counts as a free hand for all impulses. It's fantastic too. If you shield block and you reduce the damage and your shield breaks, you can use metal carapace again and get it back. Though one big weakness that is a little bit weird is if at any time you are critically hit, all of the metal carapace crumbles and shatters and you end the entire impulse, meaning you need to re-up it on your next turn every time you are critically hit. But every three character levels, the shield's hardness goes up by one, has a little bit more HP and broke thre broken threshold. So it's good. It's a great way of consistent damage reduction right at level one, which is not bad at all. I believe right at base, a regular steel shield has a hardness of 5. So at level 1, that is 5 damage reduction every single turn that you can just keep re-summoning for one action. Phenomenal. I like how I said metal doesn't have any great feats, and now I've just been doing nothing but praising it. <laughs> Shard Strike. This is a 2 action impulse that has an area of effect with 2 options, depending on if you choose shards or spines. Both of them do cause a reflex save against your class DC in their associated area. Shards do a 15-foot cone of 1d6 slashing damage that inflicts 1d6 persistent bleed damage on critical fails, while spines are a 30-foot line dealing 1d6 piercing damage and clumsy 1 on a critical failure. So it's all about what you want to do, your damage type of choice, and whether you'd rather inflict a condition or do a little bit of bleed damage. The damage increases by 1d6 every two character levels, which is pretty good. It's a decent area of effect that comes with the nice critical failure bonus. Magnetic field at fourth level doesn't feel that great. Maybe it's okay with the aura expansion. This is a one action stance impulse for metal, so you can enter it right, right when you channel your element. And when you do, you choose a polarity, repel or attract. Attract causes all small unattended metal objects to come into your space and any creature wearing metal armor or made of metal treats your aura as difficult terrain if they move away from you. Because you are attracting, moving away from you is difficult terrain. Repel does the opposite. It pushes all small unattended metal objects to the edge of your aura and causes any movement towards you from metal creatures or creatures wearing metal to be difficult terrain. At the end of the day, this makes your aura difficult terrain in only one direction. It's fine. Again, if you have a 20-foot emanation, I guess that's a really big space of constant difficult terrain, but it's fine. I have a habit of underestimating difficult terrain. I don't find it that inhibitive for a lot of creatures. I think it can be very inhibited for players, but I think it's worse on players than on creatures. And that's another problem with this feat. It doesn't differentiate creatures and allies. So if your fighter has plate mail on and they're trying to run past you towards the enemy, guess what? They're difficult terrain moving past you. Now, Plate in Treasure is a really cool action. It uses a new spell called Clad in Metal. What this does is replace the outermost layer of a metal object with any precious metal of a certain level or lower. You are casting this at half your level rounded up, and you know, things like cold iron, adamantine, other th precious metals like that that certain creatures might have weaknesses to, you can now activate to clad your ally's weapon. Or, 
one of your own items. For you, it doesn't even matter if it's a weapon or anything else. It could be a little metal ball in your pocket. Because if you are in possession of an item clad and plate in treasure that you cast, all of your metal impulses are considered to be made of that precious metal. So, right at level 4, I believe cold iron is a second level precious metal. If you plate in treasure something you're wearing into cold iron and then cast magnetic pinions, all of those pinions are now considered cold iron for the sake of triggering weaknesses. Really cool. You just keep an eye and keep track of all the different precious metals you can use at each level, because Pathfinder has a decent chunk of them, and I don't know almost any of them off the top of my head. <laughs> Consume power is okay. As a reaction, if you would take acid, electric, fire, or sonic damage, you can reduce that damage taken by your level and until the end of your next turn, your next impulse deals bonus damage equal to half your level. So a decent combo is to consume power, reduce maybe some fire damage you took, and then use Shard Strike, a big area of effect ability that the bonus three damage applies to every creature you hit with it. At first glance when I read this feat, three damage at level six didn't seem like a lot, but if you can hit four creatures with your cone, well, hey, suddenly that's 12 bonus damage. The only problem is it doesn't synergize great with Metal Carapace, as you only have one reaction, and you'll have to choose whether you want to use that for Shield Block or for Consume Power. Scrap Barricade doesn't feel great in my opinion. This is a three action overflow that basically creates a 30 foot long, 15 foot high, one half inch thick metal wall. Each section of the wall has a little bit of hit points and some decent hardness, and weirdly, you want it to be destroyed? If any section of the barricade is destroyed, the entire thing comes tumbling down, and all creatures adjacent to any section of the wall make a basic reflex save against your class DC, or take 2d8 slashing damage. It's fine, I guess it's a really cool way to, you know, you put it down in the middle of a hallway so your allies and you can retreat, the enemies have to break it down and then take the slashing damage as it comes down around them. It's fine. Every two character levels the damage does go up by 1d8 and the HP goes up as well, but I don't know. The wall spells all feel incredibly situational. Wall of Stone, Wall of Fire, Scrap Barricade, all of these, they're only useful in enclosed situations. And don't get me wrong, those come up, but it just feels rough to need them to come up for this feature to be useful. Especially as an overflow. This is not only taking your entire turn to put down, but also one of your actions next turn to rechannel. Conductive Sphere is a cool concept, but I think falls flat in the mechanical implementation. For two actions, you summon a sphere of metal that is sparking with electricity anywhere within 30 feet. All allies adjacent to this sphere gain resistance to electricity equal to your level and get to add the shock rune to all of their strikes. Though it is specifically only strikes with metal objects, so short bows or quarter stabs aren't going to work. The sphere lasts for one turn but can be sustained up to a minute, and when you sustain it, you can choose one of two actions to take. Either it moves 20 feet in any direction, or it zaps an adjacent creature for 1d12 electricity damage basic reflex save. This doesn't feel amazing. Let's look at this as a perfect turn, where it is next to two of your allies and an enemy, all adjacent at the same time. You choose to zap them. Your level 8 will say, generously, they fail their saving throw. On average, you're looking at about 6 electric damage there. And both of your allies land a hit against this creature. Well, they got the shock rune, which I believe just deals 1d6 bonus electric damage. If we average that as 3.5 bonus damage on both of their attacks, you are looking at a total of 13 damage at level 8. On a turn where everything went right. Compare that to Magnetic Pinions, which at the same level is dealing 8d4 per target. Granted, that's an overflow, and this one is not, but it just feels underwhelming. It doesn't scale, either. A lot of these metal ones, why don't they scale? Why doesn't the damage go up by 1d12 every couple of levels? Why doesn't it become a, a greater shocking rune at level 16 or something, you know? This falls behind so fast. The only good part is the adjacent ally electricity resistance equal to your level. That's not understated, you know, 8 resistance to anything at level 8 is decent. Electricity damage isn't that common. The most common form is electric arc, and even then I don't see enemies using it terribly often, so very, very niche situational impulse that I'm not a fan of. 
Another really cool impulse that I think had promise but just falls a little bit flat is Wretch Rust. You literally vomit out tendrils of rust that slap and assault everything within a 30-foot cone, which a 30-foot cone is huge. This deals 4d10 slashing damage with a basic fortitude save, meaning if you take this and the shard strike impulses, you now have the option to target fortitude saves or reflex saves whenever you need to. That's good utility. And you'd think this would have some really cool effect on metal creatures, but it just does 2d4 persistent slashing. It doesn't inflict enfeebled or clumsy. It should inflict like clumsy too. That would be great. You are literally rusting a creature made of metal. Reduce their armor class or something. That would be so thematic, but instead it's just persistent slashing damage. And that's just not great, you know? It's rust. When I think of rust, I don't think of slashing, I think of deterioration. But this does not reflect that at all. The damage goes up decently, 1d10 and 1d4 every two character levels, so it's just another decent AoE effect, but I just feel like flavor-wise it could have done so much more. Now, Reign of Razors is really cool. It's a three-action overflow, so it better be good. And it is. It's level 12. This is basically slashing damage fireball. You choose a 20-foot burst within, a, within 60 feet for 9d6 slashing damage. And on top of that, every single square affected by this burst becomes hazardous terrain, dealing three slashing damage every time a creature moves through its square. So let's assume you put this right on top of the corner of a square where a creature is. First off, they're gonna make their basic reflex save. They fail, 96 damage. Now, no matter which direction they go, it's going to be at least three squares to get out, and there's no saving throw against the square damage. So that is a bonus nine damage minimum for them to get out. Plus it sits there for a minute. So if you have other allies or even maybe you're a dual gate kineticist who can push enemies around, you can shove them back into the terrain, make them walk back out and just get shredded up. This is a really, really cool impulse that really turns the fireball, you know, general feat idea on its head. It's a cool burst, it does great damage, and then the after effect feels awesome and thematic. This is one of my favorite metal feats. Shatter Shields is also pretty cool, I have to give it credit. For one action, this is a stance, so you can do it right when you channel your element, you get four little floating plates that hover within your kinetic aura. Also, you and all of your allies just gain a plus one circumstance bonus to armor class while in your aura. That's already really good. Plus one armor class, fantastic if you don't have a bard or something. The only downside with this is that raising a shield is also circumstance, so if someone has a shield, it's not great. But if you're hanging back with the, the ranger and the wizard, that's great because on top of the armor class bonus, you also get four shields that also automatically intercept physical attacks. If you or any ally in your aura would take physical damage, the shield intercepts it, reduces the damage by five, and breaks. So this can happen up to four times around, reducing a total of potentially 20 incoming physical damage. And on your next turn, for one action, you can re-up to four shields, no matter how many are missing. If all four broke, you get all of them back for one action. As long as you're facing specifically physical damaging targets, you can look at this as 20 damage mitigation per turn passive. Well, not passively, it spends an action to activate and re-up the shields, but it's great. And every two character levels, that damage reduction goes up by one. And also worth mentioning, because I guess it could happen, if a creature would deal less damage than the plate's hardness, so at level 12, if someone was just gonna take four damage, that doesn't even destroy the plate. It reduces the damage and nothing else happens. The plate is still there, you don't even need to re-up it. It's a really cool impulse. 14th level Alloy Flesh and Steel is a really cool shape change. You know, it seems like every element of Kineticist gets some level of shape changing into their element, and metal is no different. You get to basically cast Ferris Form, which is a new spell in Rage of Elements, which turns you into flexible iron. This gives you resistance 10 to all physical damage except adamantine, and immunity too. Death effects, disease, drained, fatigued, healing, non-lethal attacks, paralyzed, poison, sickened, vitality, and void damage. Now, normally the spell gives you an hour of immunity to those effects. Alloy, flesh, and steel, A, only lasts one round and needs to be sustained, though if you do sustain it and you happen to have a metal shield equipped, like with the armor impulse, you can raise that shield as part of sustaining alloy, flesh, and steel. 
Now, the last part's a little bit weird, but let me explain. If you were suffering from any of that massive list of effects I listed earlier before you used Alloy Flesh and Steel, then when you activate it, you are immune to any persistent effects of those effects for the entire duration. But once Alloy Flesh and Steel wears off, you cannot use it again for one hour. But if you aren't suffering from those effects before you use it, you're not immune for one hour. If you are sickened and you use Alloy Flesh and Steel, you are ignoring that sickened condition for as long as you have this impulse active. But once it goes away, you can't use Alloy Flesh and Steel for one hour. But if you're not affected by sickened and you use Alloy Flesh and Steel, then once it wears off, you could activate it right away again. It's a weird one. It even says, like, it's only if you suspend the conditions. So once it's on, if someone hits you with a sickened condition, you're immune. It doesn't even affect you. You're not suspending that. It just doesn't work, which means you don't get the temporary immunity to Alloy Flesh and Steel. So you want to use it before you're affected by these conditions, not to suspend them. Because if you suspend them, you can't use it again. But if you're immune to them, you can use it again. This is a weird feat. Also at 16th level, the damage resistance goes up to 15. Level 18, Beasts of Slumbering Steel is one of the most unnecessary feats I've ever read, but I know a lot of people are going to pick it just for the super cool imagery it conjures. For three actions, not even an overflow, you summon five mountable metal beasts. And every single rider that you conjure this under gets to pick the shape of their beast. So you and up to four allies all get mountable metal monsters. And they can either have an 80-foot land speed or a 60-foot fly, climb, or swim speed. Every single person gets to individually choose the form of their mount. They have listed statistics here, and usually it only lasts 10 minutes, but if you choose to spend a full minute activating this while in exploration mode, the mounts actually last one hour. This is great if you need to travel a long distance, you can just give yourself mounts that go really freaking fast, uh, but when they are in exploration mode, their defenses and max HP are cut in half. But yeah, in the middle of combat, you can summon five flying metal dragons to lift your allies off the ground, which can let them ride up and attack the BBEG even in midair. And finally, Hell of a Million Needles, a three-action overflow, which creates a 30-foot by 30-foot by 30-foot cube area of needles. That is so many squares of effect. Every creature within that 30-30-30-foot cube needs to make a reflex save or take 13d6 piercing damage. Now, this either lasts one round or can be sustained up to one minute. And every time you sustain it, every creature in that massive cube takes 3d12 electricity damage against a basic save. And every single square a creature moves through in that 30, 30, 30 cube deals 6 piercing damage. And this all gets even higher at level 20. You are just making a 30, 30, 30 foot cube of death, which does a bunch of damage on arrival, a bunch of damage every turn if they stay in it, or a bunch of damage if they try to move through it. If you put someone right in the middle of that cube, that means it is 15 feet in any direction. They're taking at least 18 damage just walking out of it. Even better, if you put that between your party and the opposing party, and you just start shooting ranged attacks at them, they're going to need to cross that entire 30-foot area and rip themselves to shreds to get to you. So metal, very cool abilities. Some of them really fall flat in my opinion, but they are pretty damn rad. Let's move away from metal and into chapter seven. Blah. When you choose to expand the portal as a water gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Critical strikes with your elemental blast deal two splash damage per damage die of the blast, dealing the same damage type. Elemental resistance to damage with the fire and water traits. Non-magical fires within your kinetic aura are automatically extinguished, and creatures within the aura gain fire resistance equal to half your level. Train proficiency in the athletic skill and the underwater marauder skill feat, or the level 1 single gate water junction. 
Water impulses are really interesting compared to the rest of the kineticist elements. They are much more of a support element. While obviously they can stand on their own with some abilities, a lot of their impulses are based on moving things around the battlefield, like their original level 1 single gate junction, or even healing. Right at level 1, they get Deflecting Wave, which is a reaction you can use against acid bludgeoning fire or slashing damage only if you can see the origin of the effect and you are not off guard. This is fine. As a reaction, you gain your level of resistance against the triggering damage, or if it was acid or fire, double your level. At level 1, this is fine. You know, if someone hits you with a Produce Flame cantrip, you can reduce the damage by 2 right at level 1. It's not nothing, and a reaction on the Kineticist is good. There's only a handful of them. I think only some elements even get a reaction, so any damage reduction is nice. Ocean's Bomb is a solid one-action heal ability that can only be used on an individual target once every 10 minutes. For one action, you touch a willing living creature and they heal for 1d8 hit points and gain 2 resistance to fire damage for 1 minute. Also, if they're currently suffering persistent fire damage, they get a free flat check to put it out right when you use Ocean's Bomb. It's a really good one-action ability, and it scales excellently, healing an additional 1d8 and plus 1 fire resistance every two character levels. This is nice. It stacks with something like Treat Wounds, so either in combat or after a combat, you can just touch everybody up for 1d8 hit points, and then if the next combat is over 10 minutes later, it's already back and ready to be used again. Tidal Hands is an awesome impulse that's a two-action overflow, and this is sort of Water's main damage-dealing ability aside from their Elemental Blast. For these two actions, you either put forth a 30-foot cone of water, or, and this is one of the coolest ores I've ever read, two separate 15-foot cones of water originating from your hands in any different direction originating from your space. This is a basic reflex save against 1d8 bludgeoning damage, and on a critical failure, they both take double damage and get pushed 5 feet. This is really cool. The damage scales fine, 1d8 every two character levels. I love that you can either do a massive long distance cone or two cones in different directions. You're going to be able to hit so many creatures with this. I would wager, on average, you could hit three creatures with tidal hands, meaning 3d8 damage at level 1 for two actions. Fantastic. And I love a two-action overflow. Two actions to use it, one action to re-channel it. You can do that every single turn if you want to. Winter's Clutch is a little bit weaker than Tidal Hands, but is not an overflow. For two actions, you choose a 10-foot burst within a 60-foot range, and all the creatures inside make a basic reflex save against your class DC to take 2d4 cold damage. Additionally, the four squares affected by the burst become difficult terrain. Not quite as exciting or interesting as Tidal Hands in my opinion, but a longer range range and a little bit more versatile is not the right word, but it's a really different effect. You could take both and have reasons to use both of them. The damage increases by a d4 every two character levels, so the damage will never be outstanding. You know, at level 3 it's 3d4, at level 5 it's 4d4, but it'll always be okay. It's just a shame that the burst size doesn't get any bigger. Return to Sea at level 4 lets you give a creature the ability to exist in water for a short time. One willing creature within 30 feet gets the effects of the Feet to Fin spell, which gives them a swim speed but reduces their land speed. It allows them to breathe underwater and gain a plus one status bonus to armor class against any creature with the Amphibious, Aquatic, or Water trait. This bonus also applies to saving throws against those creatures. Also, any creature affected by this ability can ignore the penalty to bludgeoning and slashing attack rolls that fighting underwater usually imparts. And once you're character level 6, you can do this to 5 willing creatures, meaning you can get your entire party to be able to just function underwater better for 10 minutes. It's fantastic. Winter Sleet is the first stance available to Water Impulse Kineticist, and it's a pretty cool one. Basically, your entire kinetic aura becomes difficult terrain, and if a creature takes a move action aside from the balance action, they fall prone. Not a reflex save, they just fall prone. This means creatures cannot take the step action while within your kinetic aura, 
and they are permanently off guard as long as they are standing in your kinetic aura. Just be aware that unless you have that feat that lets you ignore the drawbacks for your allies, your allies do suffer these effects as well. But what's really cool is if you ever critically hit a creature in your kinetic aura with a water impulse, they become slowed one until the end of their next turn. Suddenly your critical hits just remove an action from your targets. And if you can hit multiple of them with something like Tidal Hands, that's awesome. And I love the flavor of how you're surrounded by this icy aura you splash them with a bunch of water and it starts to freeze on them so they slow down. Such a cool vision. Driving Rain is a solid three action overflow. For those three actions, you choose a 15 foot burst within a 120 foot range. That is a crazy distance and all creatures within that burst make a reflex save against your class DC to take 3d8 bludgeoning damage, but the effect does not end there. You create a rainstorm in that burst, which causes all creatures within it to be concealed to those outside of it and all creatures outside of it to be concealed to those within it. So the opposing team has like a spell caster and an archer. You just call down the draw driving rain on top of them, they take damage and they can't see you anymore. They're going to need to waste actions repositioning out of the rain just to be able to make attack rolls against you efficiently. The damage scales by a d8 every two character level, so it'll always be decent, but that big area of effect concealment is pretty dang solid. Alternatively, you could take Torrent in the Blood, which sounds so gruesome, but it's actually a healing spell. You shoot out a 30-foot cone of cleansing water that not only restores 3d8 hit points to every creature hit by it, but also gets them an immediate saving throw against any poison or disease currently affecting them. And what's nice about this saving throw is a normal fail does not worsen the condition. A critical fail apparently still does, but it's nice that they get an opportunity to succeed or even critically succeed to get rid of poisons mid-fight. And between Torrent in the Blood and Ocean's Bomb, you can crank out a lot of healing in the middle of combat because each ally can benefit from both of those once per 10 minutes. Torrent in the Blood may be Overflow, and Ocean's Bomb may be a Touch ability, but if you can hit the same ally with both of them in one turn at level 6, you're healing them for 6d8. That's almost as much as a 2-action heal spell, plus Torrent in the Blood is Area of Effect. Really good stuff. Call the Hurricane is a powerful overflow. I'm noticing Water Impulses get a lot of Overflow Impulses, but for 2 actions, all creatures within a 20-foot emanation of yourself take 6d8 bludgeoning damage with a reflex save against your class DC. It's a basic reflex save. Also, if you're in a body of water, the emanation increases to 30 foot. So the only downside here is that your allies can be hit by this as well. And because it's an emanation, it's a lot harder to control exactly where this goes off. But it is only two actions, so it saves you one action to reposition yourself somewhere else. This is fantastic. Additionally, if they normals fail their saving throw, they are pushed 10 feet, 20 feet on a critical failure. Damage increases by 1d8 every two character levels. While it's not anywhere close to the fire impulse's crazy amount of damage output, water does have some decent options like this one. They just mostly tend to be overflows. Speaking of overflow, impenetrable fog kind of just feels a little bit worse than the driving rain impulse. For a three action overflow, you call forth a 10 foot burst of dense fog. This functions the same way as the rain, is that anything within the fog is concealed and everything outside the fog is concealed to creatures in the fog. The only additional effect here is that the fog is also considered difficult terrain. This can be sustained up to one minute and as you grow higher level, it gets a little bit better. Every three character levels, you can make the burst five feet larger, meaning at character levels 11, 14, 17, and 20, it goes up by five feet, meaning a 30-foot burst of fog at level 20 is really good. But at the end of the day, with impenetrable fog versus driving rain, you are trading driving rain's damage for impenetrable fog's duration. This can be sustained up to one minute, while driving rain is only for one round. But I guess you can literally just make a giant smoke bomb and run away, which is really, really cute. Hey, did you want another overflow impulse? Because Glacial Prison is a two-action Overflow at level 12. I guess it makes sense that water is the one that's overflowing. I'll see myself out.
This is a really cool one, though. For two actions, you target any creature within 120 feet, and they make a fortitude save against your class DC. On a normal success, they are slowed one on their next turn. So on a normal success, you just get rid of one of their actions. On a failure, they're frozen. They lose their next turn. The problem is if they take any damage, the effect ends. The ice breaks and they break out and they're not even slowed on their next turn. So this is great to use on like a lower level target, not the boss, especially because this has the incapacitation trait. So if the creature is higher level than you, their saving throw gets bumped up one stage, which don't get me wrong. If the boss fails, they're still slowed one, which is great. But if they normal succeed, nothing's going to happen. But if they happen to have a lower level enemy who's maybe the same level as you, you could glacial prison them. They normal fail. They're out of the combat for a round. The critical failure effect is not that special. It's the same as the normal failure, but once they break out, they are slowed one until the end of their next turn. I shouldn't write that off that bad. If you can successfully get them to critically fail, they will miss their next turn, and then at the end of your next turn, they break out, and then they lose an action on the following turn. So that's sort of making the enemy lose four actions for two actions if they critically fail. Sea Glass Guardians is the ultimate support healing stance for water impulses. You enter this stance for one action or when you channel your element, and you and all allies gain a plus one status bonus to armor class and saving throws as long as you are within the aura. On top of that, if you or any of your allies become critically hit or critically fail a saving throw against a damaging effect, and remain above zero hit points, your stance activates automatically, not even a reaction on your part, and heals the target for 4d8 plus 8 hit points of free healing. The downside is the impulse ends and everybody loses their status bonuses, but on your next turn for one action, you can re-up it and no allies are immune to this effect after it occurs. It's nice and balanced in that you can't spam it in the middle of combat. It does require you to be critically hit. But overall, it's free healing for one action that will activate on its own when its trigger is met. It does not require any more action on your part. I think it's fantastic. Every three character levels, the healing increases by 1d8 plus 4, which is pretty decent, pretty okay. Combined with Ocean's Bomb and the other one, your healing output is gonna be decently close to a cleric. Also, if you happen to be in water, it heals d10s instead of d8s. Random effect, but cool. Boy, you know what would be crazy? If the next impulse we talk about, Barrier of Boreal Frost, was also an overflow. And we've seen this before with Wall of Stone and Wall of Fire. This lets you cast Wall of Ice. You do only get the Wall option, though. Normally with Wall of Ice, you can create a Hemisphere as an option. You must create a Wall, and you can choose whether the Wall is transparent or opaque, which is a cool little thing. You can choose whether or not the wall is see-through, and like the other wall feats for Kineticist, the duration is not automatic. It only lasts one turn unless you sustain it up to one minute. And then believe it or not, both level 18 feats are also overflows. Hold on a second. Not counting stances? Water impulses only have four options that are not overflows. And three of them are at level one. One's the reaction that reduces damage. One is your one action heal. One is the weaker ice explosion at level one. And the other one is the one that lets you breathe underwater. Those are the only non-overflow, non-stance impulses for water. Water is really slow. And I think that's by design. They're all pretty big, impactful effects. But it just feels weird that after level four... There are no more non-overflow impulses for water. Ride the Tsunami is so flavorful and just really, really cool. It feels like something I would see in a cheesy 80s action superhero movie. For three actions, you choose either a 60-foot cone or 120-foot line to be blasted by a massive tsunami. If you're in the water, this distance increases to 90-foot cone and 180-foot line. All creatures in the path of the tsunami take 10d10 bludgeoning damage on a reflex save against your class DC. If they fail their saving throw, they are pushed 20 feet. If they critically fail their saving throw, they are pushed 40 feet backwards. And additionally, any unattended items of one bulk or less are pushed as far backwards as possible in the area of the tsunami. 
Additionally, all non-magical flames are put out, and the coolest part, in my opinion, is that as a free action right after the impulse deals damage, you can swim straight to any point within the tsunami, literally riding the wave as it crashes down to deposit yourself in a more advantageous position. I love that you don't need to ride the wave all the way to the edge, you can stop at any point within the area. So if you shoot out a 60-foot cone, you can go to anywhere in that cone. Weird that the damage doesn't scale at level 20, though. I feel like all the other level 18 impulses for the other elements scaled a little bit of bonus damage at level 20. And finally, Usurp the Lunar Reigns, the three-action overflow, which lets you control the gravitational push and pull the moon has on water, is my least favorite kineticist feat in the entire book. I didn't like it in the playtest, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have been fixed in the full release. For three actions, you select a 50 foot by 50 foot area. That's huge. You select that area within 500 feet, and you get to choose two out of the following four effects. And let me tell you, these effects don't feel great. First, you can flood. You fill the entire 50 by 50 foot wide area with water. Now remember, the water's only five feet high, because you're only filling individual squares. Also, you can't create the water in midair. It has to be created on a surface, and the water is affected by gravity, normally. So what that means is that basically at the end of your turn, all that 50 feet of 50 feet of water is just going to go and spread out, and everyone's shoes are going to get all wet. Though for your second action, you could control it, causing the body of water to raise or lower by 10 feet. This is mostly useful if a body of water already exists there, but that does mean you could take your flood and make it 15 feet high, after which it will all go and everybody's shins will get wet. Now you could modulate your flood, causing the water to either calm down or become turbulent. Turbulent water is difficult terrain, or if they're in the middle of the ocean and it's raucousing back and forth, you could calm that 50 by 50 foot point of water, where even if it was greater difficult terrain, it becomes normal, albeit swimming terrain. Alright, so far we've only got options that really work if you're next to a body of water, but there's one left you can choose, and that is the slow option. Every creature in your 50 foot by 50 foot area must make a fortitude save against your class DC, or be slowed 1. Slowed 2 on a critical failure, that is a 50 foot by 50 foot area slow that only affects creatures with the water trait. So you could slow some fish, or a water elemental. But if there's like, an army of pirates in the water, and you try to slow all of them, they're immune. The cool thing is, you can sustain the slow up to a minute. So if you do slow like an army of water elementals, they're like permanently slowed for one full minute, that's pretty cool. I just don't know what this feat is for. You create 50 feet of water and then it spills everywhere. Or you raise the water level of something, I guess that's kind of cool. That's permanent, you know, if there's a 10 foot puddle of water and the village is gonna dehydrate, you can just conjure and raise the water and they're fine, you know, it's permanent water. You create permanent water, you can fill pools, you can make sections of a lake really rough and tumbly. You can slow fish. Please tell me I'm missing something. Comments, please help me understand what this feat is for as we go into... Chapter 8. Wood. When you choose to expand the portal as a wood gate kineticist, you can choose from the following junctions. Critical strikes with your elemental blasts immobilize your target and requires a DC 10 athletics check interact action to pull itself free. This doesn't work on any creature that could escape without effort like an ooze, or if they are not currently adjacent to any surface. Elemental resistance to damage with the poison and wood traits. Allies that begin their turn in your kinetic aura gain one temporary hit point until the start of their next turn. This increases to two at 10th level and three temporary hit points at 15th level. Trained proficiency in the survival skill and the terrain expertise skill feat specifically for forest terrain or the level one single gate wood junction. All right, we've talked about air, earth, metal, fire, and water. This is the last element, 
wood. And if I could use one word to describe wood element kineticists, it would be quirky. <laughs> wood impulses are so weird. And if you've been part of the conversation, or at least two months ago's conversation when this first came out, you would realize how many people have been memeing and making up crazy scenarios for the wood impulse feat. So let's go over them and talk about these weird freaking abilities. Let's start off with the memes right away with the one action fresh produce. One creature within your kinetic aura, which remember is a 10 foot emanation, just gets a piece of produce in their hand. It can be a banana, it can be a potato, it can be an apple. It's just a piece of fresh produce. They can spend an action to eat it and heal for 1d4 plus 1. This isn't great action economy as it costs one of your actions and one of their actions, but it does make them feel full for 10 minutes and give them resistance to, to void damage, but they cannot eat another piece of produce for those 10 minutes. Now the healing scales very well. Every two character levels, the healing goes up by 1d4 plus 5, meaning right at level 3, it skyrockets to 2d4 plus 6, and then 3d4 plus 11. So it's really decent healing that scales very well. At level 1, it's not great. Uh, but also keep in mind, it's vitality healing. So if someone only heals off of void damage, they can't use the fresh produce. So why is this a meme? Obviously, it's hilarious to say, Barbarian, you're bleeding, have a potato! But you know what's funnier? When your BBEG is giving an evil villain monologue with open, empty palms, you have the feet that makes your kinetic aura 30 feet long, and you're standing 30 feet away from him. He holds out his arm, giving the monologue of how he has manipulated the very citizens of this kingdom into giving him exactly what he... Banana. Your BBEG is now holding a banana. Because fresh produce does not say a willing creature. Choose a creature in your kinetic aura. You have given the BBEG a banana, and yes, he can heal himself with it. But it was hilarious. Hail of Splinters! This is similar to Burning Hands, but it deals piercing and persistent bleed damage in a 30-foot cone on a basic reflex save. You just shoot out a bunch of toothpicks, they poke people in the face, they start bleeding. It's awful, but it's also really, really good. That is just persistent bleed damage on a basic reflex save, which means even a success takes half of 1d4 persistent bleed damage. And both damage types go up by 1d4 every two character levels. That's great. You know, anything that scales two different damage types, especially if one is persistent, is incredible. The only downside is that A, it's overflow, and B, because it's persistent bleed damage, that won't trigger until the end of the enemy's turn. But a 30-foot cone for damage right at level one for two actions? Phenomenal. Hardwood armor. Correct me if I'm wrong but works 99% the same as the metal impulse we talked about earlier. The only difference is, is that this gives you a wooden shields statistics, whereas the steel version gives you the steel shield statistics, but where the steel armor crumbles if you're critically hit, the hardwood armor does not. Otherwise, I believe all of the armor statistics are the same, except for the armor group, which this is in the wood group, whereas the other one was not wood. And just like the steel shield, the wooden shield does get better every three character levels. Very similar feat. All right, let's get back to memes. Timber Sentinel. For two actions, you create the same effect as the protector tree spell within 30 feet. This is a tree that can basically intervene attacks on adjacent allies who are next to the tree. Reduces the damage they take. That's great, that's fantastic. It's an amazing effect that gives incredible amounts of damage reduction. Why is this a meme? If you use this impulse again, any previous one ends, and an ordinary tree remains. The trees you create with this fill a square. They're a medium-sized tree. This is not overflow. This takes two actions, meaning every single turn, or if you're out of encounter mode, every four in-game seconds, tree, 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 tree. You could make a forest in an hour. Sure, they're all like four or six foot tall trees. They're gonna keep growing. They're ordinary trees, which means they're gonna grow. They're gonna get bigger. You can just reforest anything 
What's that? You found a struggling village, which is struggling, you know, all the, all the trees died, the land is dying. Well, hey, give me three hours. Every four seconds, I can plant a tree. That's 15 trees a minute. That's 900 trees an hour. You give a kineticist one eight hour workday and you've got a forest back. It'll take a few years, obviously, for the trees to grow to full size, but this is insane. Like, it's not insane in any mechanical aspect. This is not gonna help you in a standard combat encounter, but the roleplay implications that a level one wood kineticist can just create a forest in a day, if they just wanna be lol random, they could just create a ring of trees around a settlement in just a couple of hours just to be funny. Wood impulses are weird, y'all. Ravel of Thorns at level four is a very interesting stance that requires a very specific kind of gameplay for the kineticist. When you enter this stance, your entire kinetic aura is filled with thorns. Anyone who starts their turn in these thorns takes a minus 10 foot circumstance penalty to their speed. Additionally, these thorns are hazardous, meaning every square a creature moves through deals two piercing damage. And if it happens to be in water or soil, that increases to four piercing damage because the thorns grow stronger. The caveat here is that if you ever take a move action, the thorns do disappear although the thorns do regrow at the end of your turn. So I guess there's not really a punishment for moving since they grow at the end, not at the start of your turn. So yeah, I guess you can move up to be adjacent to an enemy, end your turn, and they're surrounded by thorns. If they choose to move away from you, they're taking piercing damage, especially if you're in the dirt. Scales, not great though. Every four character levels, the base damage increases by one and the power damage increases by two. So at character level eight, these are dealing three damage per square or six damage if it's in soil. I think if you combined this maybe as a wood water dual gate kineticist, you could have some fun with it where you walk up into melee and then whack them with your water elemental blast or water impulse that can shove them. And then if they fail their save and get shoved, then hey, that's bonus. Well, no, because the thorns grow at the end of your turn. So eh, never mind. I'm not. It's a cool idea. You'd have to combine it with an ally who can shove enemies around. So a wood kineticist single gate and a water kineticist single gate would make a very good team. Tumbling lumber, final destination. You literally just rip open a portal to an American highway where one of those logging trucks is driving in front of you. The logs detach, fly through the portal and crush your enemies. The logs roll in a 10 foot wide, 30 foot long line, removing any normal difficult terrain in the area and causing a reflex save to all creatures against 2d8 bludgeoning damage. And if they fail their saving throw, they take the full damage and they are pushed out of the log's direction in the least resistant path. You know, if they're on the edge of the line, they get shoved one space to the side as the logs just roll and push them past. If they critically fail, not only do they take double damage, but they are knocked prone as the logs just completely run them over. And that's hilarious. The damage doesn't scale great, only plus 1d8 damage every three characters character levels, but I think just for the flavor of a logging truck final destinationing your enemies, it's so worth it. Dash of Herbs. For two actions, you spew out a large cloud of herb smoke to help your ally get over whatever's ailing them. Uh, you choose from a list of either confusion, disease, poison, sickened, or just injuries. Whichever one you picked, the ally first heals 2d8 plus 4 hit points, and then gets a free saving throw against that condition of whatever inflicted it upon them. Or, if you just pick injuries, the d8s become d10s instead. Fortunately, they're immune to the effect for the next 10 minutes, but you can do that to each ally. It's pretty good. Not even an overflow. Alternatively, if you're, like, making food, you can just take your powerful herbs and crush it into the food and affect up to six creatures who ingest the food. So you can give everybody a big saving throw against that sickened, or maybe you all got poisoned by an enemy and you need to get rid of it. Well, you can just make a nice little dish of mashed potatoes with some good herbs in them, and everyone can just make a free saving throw. It's pretty good. And the healing goes up by a D8 every two levels. Dash of herbs is, it's nice.
Wooden Palisade, do you like kineticist feats that make walls? Because this is a kineticist feat that makes walls. Three action overflow, you make a 30 foot wide, 20 foot high wall. It's an inch thick. What is cool about this one though, is when you create it, you can actually attach up to four ladders to the wall. So you can make them like just on your side. So your ranger could like climb up the ladder and start shooting from atop the wall. And I think that's pretty cool. Like usual, it only lasts one turn unless you sustain it every single round, and then every two character levels they get more HP, and the wall can be 10 feet longer. Which means at max level, that's gonna be a really long wall. Okay, Drifting Pollen is hilarious. This is a one action stance that triggers everyone's allergies. All creatures who enter your aura or end their turn in your aura make a fortitude save against your class DC or become sickened one and dazzled because they're getting so stuffed up and their eyes are watering because there's so much pollen in the air. And this doesn't go away when they leave their aura. Like usual, sickened can only be removed by making another fortitude save to retch up, and they are permanently dazzled until they get rid of the sickened condition. Also, they get sickened too on a critical failure. What's crazy about this ability is there's no immunity. If on your turn, you walk up to an enemy, maybe elemental blast them, and they become sickened and dazzled, on their turn, they might walk away from you for one action, spend an action retching to get rid of their sickened condition, and then, I don't know, either walk back up to you or try a ranged attack? On your turn, you can walk right back up to them, make them make a fortitude save again, and possibly just become sickened again right away. This stance is so good. Now, Sanguivalent Roots is so cool. Like of all the feats we've read here today, this one is so thematic and just interacts with the battlefield in a totally unique way. For a three action overflow, you choose a 15 foot burst within 120 feet. Every enemy in that area makes a fortitude save against your class DC to take 3d6 piercing damage from these vines. Then, Look at which enemy took the single highest amount of damage. All allies in that 15 foot burst heal that many hit points. If you hit three enemies with this, two of them critically succeeded, but one of them crit failed and took 6d6 piercing damage. Let's say they took 25 damage. All of your allies in that area heal half of that. 25 damage to a target, 12 healing to every ally in the area, and as icing on the cake, if any of those enemies also are weak to vitality damage, they take that healing in the form of damage. And you can do this for a single action every single turn when you sustain the impulse. This is constant damage and healing for everybody in that burst. That is so crazy, and the damage increases by a d6 every two character levels. So sure, it's way weaker than something like a fireball or a fire kineticist impulse, but the mechanics of dealing damage, healing allies, and then also hurting things like undead with the bonus healing is amazing. Level 12 hedge maze. Did you want more wall feats for the kineticist? Because we've got more wall feats. You can cast Wall of Shrubs, which is a new spell here in the Rage of Elements book. Square of 30 feet on a side with 15 foot high walls, and you can put up to four more walls inside, you know, making a little hedge maze. This sounds like a nightmare, unless you're using like a virtual tabletop or like a whiteboard to do the battle map. Because otherwise, you need to keep track of not only your big main wall of shrubs, but also all the mini walls inside that make it a little bit of a maze. Uh, the coolest part for me, which unfortunately that's level 12 to do this, but it's still a really cool effect, is that you can spend 10 minutes using this impulse as an exploration action to make a cabin out of shrubs. Like you have big old hedge walls and a hedge roof and it lasts for 12 hours, meaning you can safely take a long rest inside your fancy hedge cabin and that's adorable. God, wood impulses are weird. You wanna talk about weird? How about a feat that lets you put a tiny seed inside of a target that explodes inside of them? Well then, you'd have Witchwood Seed, a two-action ability overflow for the kineticist that does exactly that. You touch a creature who's adjacent to you or that you have reach for, and they make a fortitude save against your class DC. This deals 5d10 piercing damage and still deals half damage on a normal success 
and gives them a minus 10 foot status penalty to all of their speeds until the end of its next turn. If they fail, they're taking the full damage, are clumsy to and immobilized as the seed sprouts inside of them and re prevents them from moving. And the critical failure is double damage and then the same effect as the normal failure, but the effect does not end on the end of its next turn. Rather, they need to make a follow-up saving throw at the end of every single turn, and the effect only ends if they succeed. Ha, <laughs> suck. Seed? Like a seed? Because it's growing tendrils inside of them that rip through their body, dealing damage and attaching them to the ground so they can not only not move at all, but they're also clumsy because they don't have full control over their muscles as the seed overtakes their entire being. Succeed. The damage is awful, it only scales by 1d10 every 4 character levels, but just the flavor and pure, raw, disgusting nature of it is so cool. Orchard's Endurance at level 14 is fine, it's a one-action stance that basically gives AoE bark skin. You and all allies within your kinetic aura gain resistance 5 against bludgeoning and piercing damage, and you also get advantage on all checks to end persistent damage. So if you're suffering persistent bleed, you get to roll twice and take the higher amount, and every 4 character levels, so literally just at character level 18, the resistance increases to 7. It's cool because it's passive, you know, you enter the stance and then you just have permanent damage reduction. Just a little bit boring for level 14 in my opinion. And finally, at level 18, we have Rouse the Forest's Fury, a three-action overflow that summons three giant trees to fight for you. They are large in size and can be summoned anywhere within 500 feet, though they do need to be within 15 feet of each other. And I don't love this. They can flank, which is really, really cool, but the problem is that their stats are not great. Aside from being HP sponges, if you can trick your enemies into attacking them, their attack bonus is only a plus 30 at level 18. Combine this with the fact that all three trees share a multiple attack penalty. So when you use this impulse, you summon all three trees, they all get to attack once, and they even come with ranged attacks, but they share a multiple attack penalty. The first attack is plus 30, the second attack is plus 25, the third attack is plus 20. Before recording this, I did a little bit of math, I looked up a level 20 boss fight. You know, something that would be a difficult monster to fight, and obviously that's not going to count for every situation, because not all fights are boss fights, but this is a capstone feat that should be useful in a big boss fight. If you're a level 18 character party fighting a level 20 Baylor, the Baylor has an armor class of 46. Meaning that these plus 30s need a 16 to hit, and then the other two need a nat 20 because of the multiple attack penalty. I think it would have been fine if they didn't share a multiple attack penalty. A 16 on the die for each of them to hit, that's fine. On average, you're going to be spending three actions to overflow, deal 4d10 plus 9 bludgeoning damage. That's cool. I like that. Maybe you'll get lucky and hit twice. Maybe you'll get unlucky. You won't hit at all. It's the nature of the dice. But requiring a nat 20 on the following two, that's brutal. Even against other level 18 creatures, you know, the first one might hit, the second one, it's a low chance. That third multiple attack penalty feels bad. They're fine for flanking, but at level 18, off guard is so easy to inflict because so many classes get some fancy feature at high levels to inflict it. So what do they do aside from maybe your DM is nice and makes enemies attack the trees instead of you for a round? The trees can't even move. Oh, and also, every time you sustain the impulse, only one tree gets to attack. They all get to attack when you summon them, but on future turns, only one of them gets to make a strike, unless you sustain it multiple times, which will still have the multiple attack penalty problem. So, it's, I suppose, in the best case scenario, maybe you can look at this as three action overflow, deal 4d10 plus 9 once per turn, but it's not super accurate. Though something I did glance over is that if they successfully hit a melee strike with a 10-foot reach, they do automatically grab any target they hit. So if they do hit, that is a nice effect to come with it. With a DC 40 escape check, it's not bad. They'll just be more useful against lower level enemies that are swarming you rather than a single big boss fight. And the final wood impulse is Turn the Wheel of Seasons, a three-action overflow that affects a 100-foot by 100-foot by 100-foot cube area within 1,000 feet. This ability has four different effects, which always happen in order, but you get to choose which effect it starts with. Spring, summer, fall, or winter. 
The impulse lasts for four rounds. Each effect takes place for one round, and then after the fourth round, it ends. And in an interesting twist, you cannot use this impulse again until it is done. Not like it'll disable the last one when you cast a new one, you just can't cast it again until this one ends. You can't even dismiss it. So once you activate Turn the Wheel of Seasons, you can choose to start with Spring, Summer, Autumn, or Winter, and I'll go over the four effects now. They always happen in a cycle. Summer always comes after Spring, Autumn always comes after Summer, etc. Spring, every ally within the cube gains 20 temporary hit points until the start of their next, your next turn, and all allies cannot fail recovery checks. They will only be able to succeed or critical succeed. That's a fantastic effect if someone is in dire need of help. Granted, you're level 18, you probably have a healer, but you know, it's so cool. In a worst case scenario where nothing else can happen, maybe this saves a life. The summer effect of the cube is incredibly lackluster. All enemies within the cube make a reflex save against your class DC. If they succeed, I believe that's meant to say they are dazzled until the start of your next turn. And if they fail, they are blinded. There is no critical fail effect, which is really unfortunate. Even blinded for a minute would be nice on a critical fail. All this is gonna do is dazzle or blind, and that's it. Autumn causes every enemy within the cube to make a fortitude save against your class DC or become slowed one on a failure. Again, why not slowed two on a critical failure? There's no critical failure effect. Slowed one is great. You no, know, this is a 100 by 100 foot area of potential slowed one, and unlike the water impulse, at least this affects all enemies and not even affects your allies. Um, additionally, every single thing in the area is concealed, which means you and your allies are also going to have a chance of missing not just enemies, but each other if you are within this area of effect, which you want to be. It only affects enemies with most of the drawbacks, and then the spring benefit affects your allies, so you want to be within this cube. Problem just... everything is concealed. And the slowed one effect only lasts until the start of your next turn, so... eh. And then finally, Winter is a basic reflex save against only 5d6 cold damage. Again, this isn't a 100 foot by 100 foot cube, so you could hit upwards of like 40 enemies technically, so that is a lot of damage. It's just very situational, you know? If they happen to fail their save, they do take 2d6 persistent cold damage, and it's a basic reflex save, so if they crit fail, it's 10d6. It's cool, I like the idea that you could hit 50 creatures at once by just plopping Winter down on top of them, and then on the following turn it goes to Spring, which gives all your allies temporary hit points and stuff. It's just each of these individual effects feels very weak for level 18, especially with this being a three action overflow. You are spending your entire turn on this and then having to rechannel. I think being able to lay down Spring on a whim to save a dying ally, cool, or maybe multiple dying allies, cool. Being able to throw down Winter at the drop of a hat to burst an army of low level goons feels really, really powerful. Summer and Autumn don't feel great, I'll be honest. But maybe I'm missing something. It's a very complex feat that has a lot of different situations where it could be uniquely useful, so I'd love to hear if you think you could find something else interesting about it that I might be missing. And that is all six elements of the Kineticist. <sighs> Which means it's time to move on to... Chapter 9. Compound. So, here we are. The final chapter of the Kineticist class guide. Compound impulses. They're really weird and interesting. As is obvious from their name, compound impulses combine two different elements into one single impulse, and as such, can only be taken by kineticists who can channel both of the associated elements. If an impulse has the air and metal trait, then only kineticists who can channel air and metal can take that compound impulse. It is 3 a.m. as I am editing the final chapter of this video, and I cannot understand how I said compound instead of composite every time. I'm so sorry. I actually counted and there is exactly one compound impulse for every pair of elements. Since there are six different elements, I actually counted, there is 15 unique pairs of them and there are 15 compound impulses. The weird thing that I didn't really understand is that they're only level four and level six 
Obviously, most of them scale in some way, but no compound impulse is higher than level 6 or lower than level 4. So, let's talk about them and let you decide for yourself whether or not they're worth spending a feat on. Starting with Ambush Bladderwort. This is a feat which is super cool as a concept, but mechanically falls pretty flat. For three actions, you plant a tiny, almost unnoticeable seed into any square of ground or water. If a creature enters that square, then the bladderwort expands, wraps around that creature, and fills with water. The creature inside must make a reflex save against your class DC, and on a failure, they are immobilized and begin to drown. They can obviously hold their breath a number of rounds, I believe equal to 5 plus their constitution modifier, and that's where this gets a little bit weak. This was three actions to put into the ground, luckily not on overflow, but the escape DC is just your class DC, and that's not tiny, but even without their constitution modifier, five rounds to make escape checks against your class DC, they're gonna succeed probably on the two first one or two rolls. Additionally, the plant only has a 10 armor class and 50 hit points, meaning any creature of pretty much any level could feasibly critically hit this thing, dealing double damage. Once it takes 50 damage, it pops and the creature is free. Even with the lowered multiple attack penalty of multiple attacks, with an AC of 10, they're probably gonna hit it three times in one turn, especially if they're level four. Now, the flavor of the next paragraph is disgusting, and I love it. If a creature dies within the bladder wort, it shrivels up, digests the creature, and shrinks down into an edible fruit that heals you for 1d8 plus 4. Terrifying. So, what's the point of this feat? Well, it works like a little snare that can immobilize someone, but they might break out the same turn they get into it, or they might not even fail in the first place. So... I can't really recommend this feat. First off, you're only allowed to have one seed active at a time, so it's not like you can set up five squares to all catch different people. You can only have one, and if someone steps on it and makes their saving throw, it's gone, and you wasted your entire three-action turn setting it up. Or maybe they'll fail their first reflex save and then make the escape check and break out that same turn. I guess, yes, you technically removed one of their actions, but at the end of the day, this is a lot of jumping through hoops for very minor effects. I love the idea of them drowning to death in this pod. I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Every four character levels, it gets 25 more HP, and the fruit, if they die, heals for more. But, you know, a level 8 enemy that's critically hitting multiple times, 75 HP is not going to stand up to that. I'm actually level 7 in one of my campaigns right now, and an enemy critically hit for 50 damage, so two actions, two critical hits, and it's gone. Lava Leap for Earth and Fire Kineticist. This is a two-action overflow. You leap up to your speed, so roughly 25 feet in any direction, and when you land, all creatures within a 10-foot emanation must make a basic reflex save against your class DC or take 1d6 bludgeoning damage and 2d6 fire damage. Additionally, the lava cools around you, giving you, the Kineticist, a plus two circumstance bonus to armor class until the start of your next turn. So you can think of this as two actions to move, deal area of effect damage, and raise a shield all at the same time. That's pretty dang good. Every three character levels, the damage goes up by 2d6, 1d6 bludgeoning and 1d6 fire. So it's not going to be your biggest damage dealing option, but it's nice to have a movement option that can position you and deal damage and even bump your armor class all at the same time. Living Bonfire for a fire wood kineticist feels pretty bad. For two actions, you create a 10 foot by 10 foot bonfire of flaming logs and twigs. Cool. It functions like a campfire, and it lasts for up to 10 hours. But there's an interesting second ability, where as long as the bonfire is active, you can make wood elemental blasts come from your bonfire instead of yourself, and those wood elemental blasts deal 1d6 bonus fire damage. The problem is you can only do this four times, because every time you do this, one square of the bonfire disappears as you use it to fund the blast. 
So you get four elemental blasts, each dealing 1d6 bonus damage, and that's when you realize that you just spent two actions to make a bonfire to make your next four elemental blasts deal 1d6 extra damage for a total of 4d6 extra damage over multiple turns that still go away if you miss. I don't get this. I really don't. The damage only goes up by 1d6 every five character levels, so at character level 9, your attacks deal 2d6 bonus damage. It just doesn't feel great. At the end of the day, this makes a big fire that augments a couple of elemental blasts. Oh, also, this only works for ranged elemental blasts. You can't use the bonus fire damage on a melee wood elemental blast, specifically. Rain of Rust for Metal Water Kineticist is freaking rad. For three actions, you create a 10-foot burst of red, rust-inducing rain. And any creature that is made of metal or wearing metal that is in that area is Clumsy 1 until they leave that area. Additionally, if they start their turn in that area, they make a basic fortitude save against your class DC, or take 3d6 damage plus 1d6 persistent damage on a failed save. And what's interesting this is untyped damage. They just take damage and it ignores hardness. So if you're fighting like a metal golem, you can use Rhine of Rust. It bypasses their hardness. They become clumsy and they take untyped damage. Phenomenal. Damage even goes up by 1d6 per two levels, which is like the best scaling for kineticists. So really good feat. That's the first compound impulse that I look at and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's one I would personally use. The final level 4 compound impulse is Whirling Grindstone, which is just a really cool idea for an impulse. For two actions, you conjure a spinning mound of stone and metal that just constantly rolls like Sonic in place. When you summon this grindstone, you can make an impulse attack roll against any creature adjacent to it. On a successful hit, it takes 2d6 slashing and 1d6 fire damage. I just just from the friction momentum of the grindstone. This lasts until the end of your next turn, but whenever you sustain it, you can sustain it up to one minute, and upon sustaining it, it can move 20 feet and attack again. Additionally, that I think is hilarious, is any creature with a metal weapon can for one action press it against the grindstone to get plus two to their next damage roll with that weapon. That's adorable. Otherwise, it's an interesting idea. It's a different way to attack rather than just using your elemental blast. I think at the end of the day, it does a little bit more damage at level four. You know, it's doing 3d6 compared to your elemental blast, which is probably only dealing one damage die, sometimes plus constitution modifier. So it's a little bit stronger than your elemental blast and your allies can use it for a bonus. The downside is the damage scaling. It only goes up by 2d6 damage every five character levels. 1d6 bonus slashing, 1d6 bonus fire damage, and the sharpened weapon bonus damage only goes up by one. So this only happens at character levels 9, 14, and 19. So it's really good at low levels, but I believe it will get outscaled pretty quickly. Which is unfortunate, because remember, calling all the way back to chapter one, you can only get your free reflow elements on single element impulses. You cannot reflow a compound impulse. You could still retrain it, I believe, using the built-in retraining rules for Pathfinder 2e, but you can't just like pick this up when you want it and put it down when you don't. All right, the rest of these are level six impulses, starting with Ash Strider, a two action impulse for air fire kineticists. For two actions, you stride up to your speed, and you can use a fly speed if you have one, as you disperse into smoke. And like things like fog form, I think that's what it's called, uh, during this movement you can move through tiny little cracks as long as you end up on the opposite side of the structure. You also ignore any difficult terrain that, quote, wouldn't impede smoke, which is hilarious, because if someone sets up like a giant electric fan that's creating difficult terrain in your direction, that would impede smoke, so you can't go through it. Like, it would still be difficult terrain. I just think that's funny. You're also concealed until the start of your next turn, and the first creature you move through during this movement gets a basic reflex against your class DC or takes 3d6 fire damage. For level 6, 3d6 isn't insane, but it's still pretty cool and a nice little get out of jail free card because this movement does not trigger reactions. So you've got the giant ogre standing over you, you can turn into smoke, burn him a little bit, and run away. The damage does scale up by 1d6 every two class levels, so it will stay decently relevant the entire game. Desert Wind for Air and Earth is the first stance 
composite impulse we've seen so far. For one action, or when you channel your element, you enter into this stance, and your kinetic aura becomes a swirling gust of desert winds. Creatures outside of the aura are concealed from creatures inside of it, and creatures inside the aura are concealed from creatures outside of it. However, creatures outside of the aura are not concealed from you. You can see through your own desert winds, allowing you to attack through it unabated. And what's really cool is this to me is the first composite impulse that mechanically really incorporates both elements. As long as you are in the desert wind stance, whenever you use an air impulse, you deal one extra slashing damage as your air impulse carries little shards and chunks of rock and sand at your target. This damage is actually two bonus slashing damage if it's a single target impulse like Elemental Blast. I just love that this is Earth augmenting air regularly, like it's augmenting the air impulses. I think that feels super cool. And every two levels, the extra damage increases by one or two if it's single target. So this stance will always just increase the flat damage of your air impulses, which is great because aside from two action elemental blasts, kineticists don't get a lot of flat guaranteed damage bonuses on their impulses. They get more damage dice, but they'll never really ever get that flat plus two, plus four, plus six. So that's really nice to have. Elemental Artillery, once again, isn't super powerful, but is just radical. For three actions, if you are a metal and wood kineticist, you summon a gigantic ballista. Well, I'd say gigantic, it's medium sized, so it still fills a five foot square. And upon summoning it, you get to shoot a target up to 120 feet away with an impulse attack roll for 3d12 piercing damage. Now, the Ballista does require two interact actions to reload it, though it doesn't say you have to spend those actions. You can, but your allies can also help you reloading the Ballista. Additionally, on your turn, when you sustain this impulse, you can move the Ballista 20 feet in any directions and either shoot it or get one action towards reloading it. This is really fun. You know, it's a little bit stronger than your Elemental Blast with a way longer reach and your allies can help you use it. You know, if no one's damaged right now, you and the Cloistered Cleric are sitting on the back line, they can help you reload this thing on their turn and then you can just keep shooting it at targets a really far distance away. It's fun. It's not super broken. It's not like crazy optimal, but it's really fun. Jagged Berms for Earth and Wood is so close to being good but there's one sentence that ruins it. For three actions, you create up to six mounds of packed in earth that each fill a five foot square on the battlefield. And they all have to be within 120 feet, but they don't have to be touching. They can be anywhere and everywhere. They also provide cover if someone chooses to take cover behind them. Additionally, each of these mounds of packed earth have sharp wooden spikes sticking out in all adjacent directions. So anytime a creature passes through one of these adjacent squares, they take 2d6 piercing damage. Do you see the problem with that explanation? Quote, For each square of wooden stakes a creature enters, they take the damage. So if you put this next to an enemy and conjure it up, they don't take the damage from the spikes sticking out into them. And then if they walk away from it, they don't take damage because they didn't enter a space with a spike. I'm shocked these can't deal their damage on being cast. It's a three action overflow for 2d6 damage. That's not that much to ask. They only deal damage if a creature enters the space. So once again, if you have someone else who's specialized in shoving people around or blasting them like a water kineticist, maybe you could make them work, but on their own, creatures are just going to avoid them. The wall has some basic statistics so they can be destroyed. Their HP goes up by 10 every two character levels, as well as the piercing damage, if it happens. Lightning Rod is awesome, and if it can stick, it really powers up air and metal together, which is good because this is an air-metal composite impulses. For three actions, you conjure a rod of metal and drive it into your foe. You make a melee elemental blast, and on a hit, this drives into them as part of the attack. So long as this metal rod is inside of the creature, they take a minus one circumstance penalty to armor class and saving throws against all electricity effects. And if the creature is already made of metal or wearing metal, the penalty is increased to minus two. 
They also immediately get a basic reflex save against 1d12 electricity damage, so really cool. They take the penalty to that saving throw right there. If it can stay inserted into them, all of your electric impulses are going to be more accurate. The downside is it's only a DC 10 athletics check to remove it. Also, the 1d12 bonus electricity damage only goes up by 1d12 every six character levels? At levels 12 and 18, you get one more d12 of damage. Like, don't get me wrong, you still get your elemental blast as part of it, but this was also a three action impulse. So after that initial attack, you can't even take advantage of the metal rod. And all they need to do is roll a 10 or higher athletics check. You're level six. Creatures are probably going to have like a plus 12 athletics. They just look at it. Sure, they waste an action going boop. And that's something, you got to deal damage and take one of their actions, which, you know, I've, I've talked about that being great beforehand. It just sucks that it gives you all these cool penalties, but it's so easy to get rid of before you can really take advantage of those penalties. But the penalties are against all electricity effects, so maybe someone else can take advantage of it, like your wizard casting lightning bolt. That'd be pretty cool. Molten Wire for Fire and Metal Compound Kineticis is, again, really cool visually. It just feels okay mechanically. For two actions, you make an impulse attack roll against a creature within 15 feet of you. If you successfully hit them, they become wrapped and bound in metal flaming wires for one minute. They take 2d6 slashing damage on the success and 2d4 fire damage at the start of every one of their turns, plus clumsy one. Now the 2d4 fire damage is on a basic reflex save, and they can make escape checks against your class DC. Even worse than that, just like the seed at the beginning of this chapter, it only has an AC of 10 and 75 hit points. That's two or three good critical hits to take it down completely. But I suppose, in a decent world, you get to deal 2d6 damage followed up by 2d4 fire damage if they fail their save, and let's say it takes three attack rolls to break through it, well, I guess you also skipped their turn. And if that happens, that is phenomenal. It only feels a little bit bad if they succeed their first escape check to get out of it. The damage increase is negligible as well. It's only every four character levels that the base damage increases by 1d6, the damage per turn increases by 1d4, and the wires get 25 more hit points. Rising Hurricane, now this is a fun impulse. It is a three action overflow for air, water, compound kineticists. You create a cylinder within 120 feet that is 40 feet tall and 30 feet in diameter. All creatures within it make a basic fortitude save against your class DC and take 2d6 bludgeoning damage. But every creature that fails its saving throw can be lifted as high as you want to within the cylinder and then dropped. If it does not have a fly speed, the creature drops all the way back to the ground, taking damage equal to half the distance it dropped. Which means if a creature normal fails their save against this impulse, they are taking 2d6 bludgeoning plus 20 flat fall damage, unless they have a fly speed. The damage scaling is okay. Every three character levels, they take 1d6 more base damage, and the cylinder's height, unfortunately, only increases by five feet leading to an average plus two flat damage every three character levels. Roiling Mudslide, I don't think was double-checked in editing, because as it's written, A, it's really weak, and B, there's a lot of sentences that don't make sense. I'm just going to read this out verbatim for you, and hopefully you can figure out what doesn't make sense. It is a two-action impulse for Earth-Water compound kineticists, you form earth and water into a mudslide that smashes your opponents and coats them in mud. Each creature in the area takes 2d8 bludgeoning damage with a basic fortitude save against your class DC. A creature that fails is also pushed 5 feet or 10 feet on a critical failure and coated in mud until the end of its next turn. While coated in mud, the creature falls prone at the end of its movement any time it ends a move action other than a crawl or step. The creature can attempt an acrobatics check or a reflex save against your class DC, avoiding the fall if it succeeds. There's a few questions here. Each creature in the area? What's the area? And then it goes from saying a creature that fails to saying the creature falls prone. I think they were trying to decide between making this a single target effect 
and an area effect, and they settled on an area effect, at least I assume so, with it only dealing 2d8 damage, but they forgot to give it an area and rewrite the second half of the feat to reference the creatures, like any affected creature while coated in mud, you know? So, I don't know what the area is supposed to be, I don't know if this is in your kinetic aura, I don't know if this is a burst, or a cone, or a line, but this feat isn't finished, unfortunately. Sorry, Earth Water kineticists. You have the outline of a feat with some crucial missing information. Uh, the damage only scales by 1d8 per four character levels. Like, I'm not crazy, right? I know I misread a lot of feats, but this one just says in the area. And it's not a stance, so it doesn't use your kinetic aura. So, you know what I think of when I think of mixing the speedy burning power of fire with the brutal power of water? Super Mario Brothers. Wahoo! Steam Knight is a one action stance impulse for fire and water compound kineticists. When you channel your element, you can enter your Steam Knight stance and gain the following benefits. First off, you get a 10 foot status bonus to your speed, and the leap action now lets you jump up to your speed in any direction. And at the end of your jump, you do not automatically fall as long as your next action is also to leap. If you leap over a creature and come within 10 feet of them, they take 2d6 fire damage with a basic reflex save. You are literally Mario jumping on people's heads and burning them. Additionally, at the start of every turn, you can emit steam as a free action, dealing 2d6 fire damage to every creature in your kinetic aura on a basic reflex save. If they fail, they're also pushed 5 feet. Once again, like the other stance, as hilarious as it is that this just turns you into Super Mario, uh, I love how much it combines the mechanics of fire and water. You know, it deals the pretty solid consistent damage of fire with the pushing element of water along with the speed bonus of fire. It really feels like you're using both elements together and that's awesome. Now, the damage only increases every five character levels by 1d6, so it's not going to be a whole bunch of damage, but the movement is incredible, and the free burst of steam damage every turn is a free action, that's amazing. And our final composite impulse for air wood kineticists is the Tree of Duality. You conjure a tree floating on a cloud anywhere within 60 feet, meaning it can float above the ground and it constantly shakes off pollen and fungal spores. The pollen heals allies for 3d4 hit points either when it is summoned or when they enter the area. However, this can only happen to each individual ally once every 10 minutes. But additionally, enemies nearby the tree become dazzled. No saving throw, just dazzled. And even if they leave the area of the tree, they are dazzled until the start of their next turn. That's fantastic. By itself, a level six feet that is guaranteed dazzled in an area of effect, sign me up. Also, I think I misspoke. It's not just anyone adjacent to the tree. It is a 10 foot emanation from the tree. 10 feet in every direction from the tree. It's also not even an overflow and it doesn't say you can only have one. So if you want to, you can just pop these trees down, granted for three actions, so you probably could only have one, but you could use this every single turn to keep enemies permanently dazzled. This is a three action ability that auto dazzles any creature, giving them a 20% miss chance forever, as long as you keep using it, and even heals each of your allies once. That's pretty damn good. The healing scale's okay, 1d4 extra healing every two character levels, but just free dazzle, no cooldown. They're not immune to the dazzle. It's till the start of their next turn, even if they leave the aura. That's amazing. That's incredible. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are done with the Rage of Elements Kineticist class deep dive. Oh my god. I hope you enjoyed. I want to know if any of you got through this in one sitting. Because I am currently up to over five hours of raw footage that all needs to be edited. So if you sat through this in one sitting, 
kudos. If you watched each chapter in a sitting, kudos. Each chapter is gonna be like 15 minutes at least. Thank you all for your patience, for your support. And hey, it's been a long time since I made a really long video. So for those of you who love your essays that you can just put on in the background forever, there you go. And I hope you like that kind of video because coming real soon, we're diving right in to the remastered deep dives of all of the new Player Core 1 classes. Now that the content embargo is up and the remaster is out, we are diving headlong into everything the classes have to offer. So sincerely, thank you so very much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, no nat ones.